Cabin Man. This is a throwaway account I made after discovering this subreddit, and I wanted to share my story. So here it goes. It was about late November in Colorado, and I was about seven or eight. My father got the idea of taking us all for a weekend to a cabin he was going to rent. My mother thought it was a great idea for me, my sister, my father, and my mother to bond. We rented a cabin for a few days. We took off school on Friday to get a head start on getting there, which I had no issue with. We got there and it was sure cold. Well, it was almost December, so I guess it made sense that it was cold. Anyway, we got up and decided where we'd all sleep. We ate dinner, then we got all set up for bed and we're thinking what we do tomorrow. We got there kind of late, so we couldn't do much on the first day. That night, though, I heard noises outside. It sounded like kind of footsteps. I looked out the window and I saw nothing, so I figured it must have been an animal. I tried to go back to sleep. Then about 15 minutes later, I heard it again. I woke my sister up, but she was about 11 at the time, and she heard it as well. We both walked over to the window and saw something out there. We weren't quite sure what it was. We decided it'd be best for it to not see us, so we went back to sleep. I had a hard time sleeping that night, and so did my sister. But when we did eventually wake up, my mother was inside making breakfast and my father was outside. I asked my mom if I could go outside with dad and she told me sure, while my sister stayed inside and waited for my mother to finish breakfast. I walked outside and my father was talking to some man, a short chubby man. He had a shaved head and was wearing a veteran cap. He looked really nervous too, for some reason. He was sweating a lot as well, even though it was freezing outside. I walked over to him and my father. My father looked at me and said, Oh, this is my son, and told him my name. The man looked at me and said, Nice to meet you, kid. My name's Patrick. He smiled and looked at me. I smiled and greeted him back. And it may have been rude at the time, but I was just a kid. And I asked him, You look kind of scared. Are you all right? And he kind of coughed and replied with a, Yeah, I'm fine. I just went through shell shock. I'm a veteran, as I couldn't tell already with the cap he was wearing. He seemed normal then. My father seemed to really like this guy, and I liked him at first too. He told my father that he had also rented a cabin with his family, and that we were really close to us, so he decided to introduce himself. My father invited him inside for breakfast and he stayed, and it was normal. I went outside to play after that with my father and Patrick. While outside, I fell and scraped my knee and started crying. My father was inside at the time. A bad time for him to be inside. My mother was calling for him and he ran inside while I was out there with Patrick. Patrick ran over to me and told me to come with him to his cabin because he had band-aids. I agreed and went with him. I wasn't a very smart kid. I went with Patrick. We talked about what I liked doing and I told him about the video games I played and stuff like that. Then things got weird. He asked me what my shoe size and how old I am. I didn't know what my shoe size is, but I told him my age. He just kind of chuckled and said something along the lines of, Good to know. Also, his cabin was nowhere near ours. It was way back. It took about 20 to 25 minutes to walk there. I was tired and there was no point in getting the bandit anymore. But I still decided to keep going since I had walked so long. We entered the cabin. He told me to go in first, so I did. As soon as I walked in, I realized something. There was no one in there. No family. I asked him where his family was and he didn't answer, pretending like he didn't hear. He locked the door, then kind of got frightened. He told me, I'll be back with the band-aid, kiddo. He walked into the kitchen and pulled one out of somewhere. Then he walked back to me and told me to have a seat, and he'd put it on. I sat down and he put it on me. He also held my leg with his other hand and rubbed up and down it and told me, You're rather muscular, kid. I like that. I kind of got scared and immediately stood up. He asked me what was wrong and I told him nothing, and my leg was feeling much better. I then thought my parents would be worried sick about me and that I should hurry back. He insisted I stayed a little longer and ate there. I didn't want to, but I was alone, and if I ran, I don't think I could find my way back to the cabin. The door was locked, too, so I agreed and decided to eat with him and just get it over with fast. He asked how much I weighed, and I guessed about 73 pounds. He nodded and said, Perfect weight. I asked him, Perfect weight for what? And he just kept smiling. I was really weirded out and asked him if I could go. He told me no and that things were just getting started and I shouldn't miss out on the fun. He had such a weird tone when he said that too. I then heard a big bang from the bedroom. It was a closed door. Patrick stood up and looked kind of angry. He walked into the room and shut the door behind him. I then heard him yelling, Did I fucking tell you you could move? No, stay the fuck where you are. 
I have f***ing company. Or something like that. He then walked out with a smile on his face and shut the door slowly. Sorry about that. It was just my wife. She's really sick and not allowed to be near visitors today. He was smiling while saying that. I wanted to go. I then looked around the room and I noticed that there were clothes everywhere and it was really messy. He must have been living out here. At that moment, his wife walked out of the room. I'm hungry, she said. He looked pissed. Get back in there, he said. His wife was extremely pale and looked like she had been crying a lot. She was sniffing and had red circles around her eyes. She looked at me, then walked back in the room. I asked him where his kids were. He didn't answer. He told me he had kid clothes that he wanted me to try on. That was the last straw. I had to get out of that situation. I didn't know how. I started crying and then he hugged me. He told me, It'll be okay, little one. Nothing is going to happen. Just try on these clothes. He walked in the back room and I thought that was the perfect time for me to leave. I unlocked his door and tried to leave as quietly as I could. I didn't care if I got lost anymore. I didn't want to take any more chances with Patrick, if that was even his name. I had a feeling that he had been lying. He lied about having kids, so who knows what else. I was in the woods trying to find my way back. I was still close to his house, close enough to hear him shouting. I could hear him yelling stuff to his wife, things along the lines of, Where the f*** did he go? And, I knew I shouldn't have left him alone. You probably let him leave. I could have sworn I heard him call her a and a bitch a couple times. Then it happened. I stopped in my tracks. I heard footsteps. I went and hid behind a tree and looked in his direction. He was outside and seemed to be looking for me. I was far away enough to where I could barely see him, but I could still tell he was looking for something. He then stepped out into the forest and I could hear him shouting, Hey kid, it's okay. You can come back now. You don't have to try on the clothes. And, I have toys back at the cabin. All you have to do is come back. I ran as fast as I could in a straight line in hopes I would find somebody in my family. I was running away and I thought I heard shouting, but I didn't stop to hear it. And then after about an hour of running, I saw a cabin, my cabin. I ran to it. My father was outside looking around, looking for me. I ran up to him crying and told him Patrick wasn't a good guy and that he was really weird and touching my leg and stuff. My father immediately called the person he rented the cabin from and he said that nobody had rented it. My father looked at me and told me to never follow any stranger again. We immediately left that day and asked for a refund for the next day. The guy renting them out apologized. The man having cabin rentals called the police and the police went back there and checked the cabin and there was nobody back there, not even his wife. His clothes and belongings were still there is what they told us. Nothing really happened after that. They asked us questions and left. They never called us or anything about him ever again. Patrick most likely wasn't his real name. And he probably wasn't a veteran. I just want to know what happened to him and his wife. And how he even got with his wife in the first place. And why he lived in the back of that cabin. He seemed to have been living there for a while. I guess that he left because he figured the police would be coming after him because he didn't rent the cabin. So many questions that I'll never get answered. I'm just glad that it's all over. And I hope I never have to see the cabin man again. Disturbing Camping Encounter Background I work summers as a camp counselor in northern parts of Ontario, Canada. On the night that this particular incident occurred, I was camping with a group of 10-year-old boys on the same lake the summer camp was based on. So like a routine camping trip, we canoe out to the site and set up our tents. Me and my co-counselor, Mike, take turns supervising the kids while they swim, build forts, play games, etc. We cook some food over the fire, sit around and tell stories, cook s'mores, the typical Canadian camping experience. Around 9.30ish, I tell the kids that it's time for bed and they head to their tents, which were positioned a small walk away from the shoreline, but still in the line of sight from where we had the fire pit. So the kids have gone to bed, and me and Mike are shooting the shit out of the water smoking a cigarette, just basically hanging out before we decide to head into our tents and call it a night. What happened next still troubles me to this day, and remains my go-to campfire story. We were both gazing into the pitch black night water when we saw a small light approach us slowly and above the water level. We speculated what it could possibly be for a few minutes before it came close enough to see that it was mounted on the front of a kayak and that somebody was approaching our campsite. Now, it's important to note that as a camp counselor, part of our training goes over how to deal with stranger encounters in an environment where we're responsible for a group of children on public property. I was prepared to give the mystery peddler the typical speech on how we are camping with a group of a recognized organization and we would respectfully ask they find another campsite. However, this person's appearance shook me to the bone. 
as the light drew nearer. Paddling the kayak was a woman who looked to be in her 60s. She had incredibly long wisps of gray hair that was trailing in the water. Her skin looked like old leather, and her dead-looking eyes were tough to spot under all her wrinkles. She looked directly at me, and as she spoke, I realized that she was missing most of her teeth. Are all your children safe in bed? She asked to me, pointing in the direction of the tents. Not really knowing how to respond, and quite frankly, f***ing myself. I responded by telling her that they were fine and she should leave. That's good. Just as expected for this time, she said with a smile, then turned her kayak and paddled off into the night. And at this point in time, myself and Mike were legitimately very creeped out of not only the appearance of the mystery woman, who resembled a freaking corpse, but also her inquiry on the whereabouts and safety of the kids we had brought on this trip. Not knowing what else to do, we grabbed our hunting knives and sat by the fire checking on the kids. Half an hour later, it started to get really creepy. Across the lake, a female counselor was leading another trip for kids the same age group. She sent me a text reading something along the lines of, Hey Sean, stop screwing with us. This isn't funny. My kids are really creeped out. I instantly called her and let her know that I had just seen someone near my campsite that seemed eerie, that I was not trying to play a joke. Apparently one of the kids had opened their tent door to take a piss and seen a woman with long hair standing with her arms open towards them near the shoreline. Old Man in the Woods Back in 2008, I was a student planning to go to university and needed some extracurricular stuff I could put on my entry applications. As most UK students know, one of the best things to have on there is the Duke of Edinburgh Award, link for those unfamiliar. As part of this award, you have to embark on an orienteering expedition, basically a long trek through woodland and rural villages following nothing but a map and compass, no GPS allowed. It's a teamwork experience and you camp and overcome hurdles together, etc. Anyway, I was out of shape at the time, so my uncle volunteered to take me out into the middle of nowhere to get some idea of what orienteering was like. We didn't stay out overnight like I would have if we did the real thing, but we hiked maybe 10 miles through woods in a small village in pretty abysmal weather. By the end of our journey, we were soaked to the bone and pretty miserable, looking forward to getting back to the car and heading home. For the last part of the journey, we were on a dirt trail heading uphill with bushes and trees on either side. We were marching onward in silence at this point, when all of a sudden there was a rustling in the foliage to our left. From behind a large bush stepped an old man in a black suit with a red bow and dress shoes. He looked late 70s, early 80s, very pale, long silver dots on his face, and a gray-white comb over. I was instantly weirded out. Who dresses like that to go into the woods? The instant I thought seeing a guy his age out there in those clothes, in those weather conditions, was this guy's lost his marbles. There was something else that took me an extra moment to notice, though, that puzzled me. The guy was bone dry. Didn't even have mud on his shoes. We stopped in our tracks and just stared at the man for a moment, who appeared to be frozen and shocked at seeing us. My uncle made the first move, taking a step towards him, asking if he was alright. The old man continued to stare for a moment, not moving even a twitch, then suddenly became very animated. It was like he suddenly snapped out of a trance. He started flailing his arms wildly, saying something awful had happened, that a good friend of him needed his help. He began walking backwards into the woods, motioning for us to follow him, which we did. We started off at a brisk walk that escalated into running as we struggled to keep up with the old man. After maybe a minute, he disappeared ahead of us. We could hear him, so continued to follow the noise until we reached a huge slope. We stopped at the edge and looked down to see the old man standing at the bottom, motioning us, pleading with us to follow him. I remember looking down and the slope was probably at a 40 degree angle, spanned for perhaps 50 feet and more and slick with mud. It looked like an accident waiting to happen, especially given there was no shrubs or roots to hold on to anything. I remember looking down at the old man on the other side of the slope and wondering, how the heck did he cross that so quickly and so cleanly? I mean, at that distance, it's hard to see in fine detail clearly, but I swear he did not appear to be wet or muddy at all. Me and my uncle looked at each other and I saw that he was getting as weirded out as I was. Despite my feelings, I made a step toward the edge and was going to try to make my way down when my uncle grabbed me firmly by the arm and pulled me back. Under his breath, he said to me, Something's wrong here. We took a step back from the edge at this point, and the old man at the bottom started getting irate. He began pleading with us again to come down the slope, telling us he needed our help. His friend was in trouble. My uncle shouted down at the old man that we would head back to our car and call emergency services for him, that professional help would be on its way soon, that they would have all the tools to help him, etc., the old man suddenly got furious. He began jumping up and down, demanding that we come down the slope right now or there would be hell to pay. His voice had changed drastically. He was practically growling his words, 
His hands bunched up into fists, pounding his knees like an angry toddler throwing a tantrum. I've never seen a grown adult fly into such a rage in my life. His eyes looked like they were on the verge of bursting out of their sockets. His skin gone from pale to red in almost an instant. We began to hurriedly make our way back the way we came, his demands and threats were getting less audible as we got closer to the trail. Once we were on the trail, we practically power marched the remaining quarter mile or so to the car, all while my uncle was on the phone to emergency services, explaining to them that there was a possibly mentally ill man wandering the trail. We were ordered to get in our car and await the police so we could show them where we had encountered him. About an hour later, we met four officers, two of whom had dogs with them and packs of supplies like first aids, emergency blankets, etc. We led them to the exact spot and then pointed the two officers with dogs in the direction that he had led us through the bushes. The search lasted all week, but there was no trace of the old man. Officers said that the only trail they could pick up was mine and my uncle's. They didn't find any footprints or anything belonging to the old man we encountered. One of my weirdest experiences to date. Chased and stalked through the woods at night. Hey, female 24, UK. Despite a few creepy instances as a child, there's only been one time in my adult life that I have truly felt primal fear. My apology if it's a little long, but trust I am being as concise as possible and need to explain the surroundings a little first. I live in a village in the middle of the English countryside. To paint an accurate picture of its size, it has a population of about 4,000, but feels more like 1,000 due to its spread out nature and being surrounded on all sides by a lot of fields farms, and woods that eventually connect onto a pretty famous forest. It's kinda in the middle of nowhere, and because it has notoriously bad phone and internet connections, having lived there all my life I know the place like the back of my hand. In a world of public footpaths through the woods slash fields are, where they connect, which are shortcuts, where to cross the deep streams, etc. I have gone on walks in this area through my childhood with my parents, and alone as an adult. Nothing bad had happened. I felt safe here. The story takes place last summer in July, after I moved back home from university. Had yet to get a job and smoked a lot of weed, a habit my parents despised and which I tried to keep hidden from them by going on evening walks, multiple pre-rolled joints hidden away in my hoodie pocket. As usual, this day we both got home at 5 p.m. We had dinner but chatted for a little while longer than usual, as my mom had quite a hectic day and was telling me about it. Because of this, I ended up heading out for my walk an hour later than routine, around 7 p.m., but as it was summer, the sun was still shining, so honestly, I didn't really notice that it would start getting dark while I was still out. The woodland closest to my house is less than five minutes away, and you enter through a gate on the farmer's field. You can see across the open area quite far until the first set of small woods of Scurry View. That's where I was heading as I knew that the track takes under two hours and leads back to the same path I was standing on now. More than enough time for me to smoke at three joints I had in my pocket, and for the smell to leave my clothing, I thought. The entire area is very popular for dog walkers so it's not unusual to see other people while you're about, and as this is a village, everyone says hello to everybody. I lit my first joint and started walking. I'm just in my own world for a while until I was less than 100 feet from the entrance to the woods. An elderly man was coming out of them throwing a ball for his collie dog. I finished my joint and stubbed it out. As I got closer, I recognized it was John, who lived on the road next to mine and knew my grandpa. We stopped and said hello as I stroked his dog, Max. While talking, I see another man coming out of the woods, no dog, bright green jacket, very tall and had a good 10 years on me age-wise. Me and John chat for another minute and say goodbye. He warns me not to stay out here too long as it will start getting dark soon. True, the sky was bright pink and orange. The sun was indeed beginning to set. I hadn't really noticed. I continued on down the path towards the man. When we were nearly passing each other, I looked to make brief eye contact, smile and say hello, like everyone here does, even if you don't recognize the person. My eyes instantly met his. He was already looking at me. His dark eyes logged onto mine. He wasn't smiling. I didn't know if it was him, but all I knew was something was wrong. It was in his eyes. I swallowed my politeness and looked at the ground as we passed. I had lived in my uni city the past couple years, so I knew the red flag when I saw one, and my country bumpkin manners evaporated. I quickened my pace a little before entering the woods and slyly looked back. The guy was still walking in the same direction following John. I felt relieved laughed, cursed the weed for making me paranoid while lighting up another joint, started making my way into the woods. It takes about 30 minutes to follow the path through the woods to end. The pathway exit opened into another field that led to another set of woods. The sky was now violet, the dimming light having been obscured to me by the trees. I was already smoking my last joint, 
and was near the entrance to the second set of woods when I felt it. Fear. Complete, crippling, absolute fear worked its way like electricity through every layer of flesh. I'd never felt anything like it before, or since, but I knew what it was. I whipped around. Standing at the exit of the first set of woods was the man. I could still make out his green jacket in the fading light. He's fucking doubled back, and very quickly too. I had looked back several times while in those trees and he hadn't been there. For a second I froze, as did he. He knew I'd seen. To sprint at the distance between us would take about five minutes. He was obviously in good shape. I threw the spliff and bolted through the woods, the only way I could go. I didn't dare look behind me. I sprinted for a couple minutes before taking a sharp left turn off the path into the trees, hoping to throw him off a bit, but I couldn't see a f***ing thing. The light was already darkening and the trees made it look a hundred times worse, especially as I am now in the thick of them. Their branches catching on my clothes like fingers whipping and scratching my bare legs so bad I bled. I ran and ran, my lungs protesting in pain, hating me for smoking so much, while my heart was throwing itself against my ribcage trying to escape. I couldn't anymore. I threw myself on the ground behind a particularly thick trunk, my back against it, knees to my chest, hand thrown over my mouth to stifle my labored breathing, desperately trying to pump air into my lungs for the next sprint. I listened for the first time. A few seconds pass silently. Then I hear him, heavy football snapping twigs behind me about 20 feet to my left. I dare not look in case he sees me. I have my phone, but I know I have little chance of getting signal being where I was. And I knew he'd either hear me talking or see the light from the display. I'm not ashamed to say at this point I started to cry. The tears falling silently down my cheeks. What the f I hear a deep voice exclaim, where are you? I know you're here. I saw you. I have to clasp both hands across my mouth to stop my scream from escaping. I can hear him moving around. I panic and I find enough courage to slowly peek from behind a tree. He was about 10 feet behind me, less than 20 feet to the left, with his back to me. I moved back and my eyes searched the area around me. I picked up a pretty heavy rock. I carefully check on him again and his back is still turned but he's searching through the trees, hunched over lower on the ground now. I make a snap decision and with everything I had left I threw the rock behind me to the right. It clattered through the branches of trees and made one hell of a noise. I watched him. I watched him immediately bolt in its direction. I'm laughing. He f laughed. I paused a little hearing his footsteps get quieter until I thought I wouldn't be so visible to him if I moved and if I threw myself forward. I ran, trying to put as much distance between us as possible, but I was also aware that I was getting further and further away from home. I knew there had to be a stream somewhere close. If I found the stream, I could follow it as it borders the land and ran parallel to some of the footpaths. I ran, I ran, and ran, until the trees finally cleared and I could just make out another field to them on the other side. I thank God and push myself a little bit further till I'm out of the trees and the ground disappears from below my feet and I go head over shoulders down the stream embankment. I crash into the water below my mouth open and lungs filling with muddy water. As I splutter it out, I feel both relieved to have found the stream and terrified he's heard me. My phone is now ruined. I slowly make my way downstream as quiet as possible, listening out for him the whole time as the stream borders the woods, looking up periodically just in case. After a while, maybe half an hour, I notice the trees begin to thin out and realize this is the end of the woods, where I would have been exiting and where the pathway connected to the original one I started on. If I ran, I could get home in less than 20 minutes. As quiet as I could, I dragged myself on my stomach back up the embankment army style, wanting to stay as low as possible. I peek over the top. I could just make out the opening of the wood exit path about 50 feet away. I sat and scanned the forest line for a couple of minutes, my eyes trying to make out movement despite it now being pitch black. Nothing. I couldn't hear anything either. I pushed myself up and sprinted as fast as I could across the field onto the pathway. I knew the gate I'd entered through was in the adjoining field. It really wasn't far. I was so happy. You f bitch! Came a screech from across the field. I swear my legs nearly gave out then and there. He had been waiting for me. I turned my head and saw him sprinting out the woods at full pelt. I screamed and pushed myself further, tears coating my face. All I could do was run. I crossed into the main field and I could see the moonlight shining off the metal gate. My house was just five minutes away after that. I have never focused on anything as much as that gate. He was faster than me and getting closer screaming at me the whole time about how he was going to slit my throat. 
I ran and ran, pushing myself up and over the gate and ran up the road. I dared look as I made the turn for my road. He was still f***ing following me. I raced up into the driveway and threw myself through the door, running into the living room, crying and screaming hysterically, pointing behind me towards the door. My dad ran outside while my mom grabbed a hold of me as I collapsed, shaking. As it turns out, my parents had already called the police, as I was going out for an hour or so at 7, and it was now past 12 a.m., and I had an answer when they called my now-broke phone. Very unlike me. We called the police station to explain. They came and I gave a full statement. Both my parents and the police were horrified. Nothing like this happens here. There hasn't been a reported for murder in the last hundred years. But one look at me and it was obvious I was telling the truth. I was covered head to toe in cuts and bruises, soaking wet and covered in mud and blood. I won't go into how this experience changed me. It's depressing. But I will say that the thing that scares me the most is that they never even had a suspect. Despite him following me so closely, he was gone by the time my dad ran outside. The guy is still out there. And who knows what he's really capable of. Hey Reddit, I'm a male living in Johannesburg, South Africa, also noted as one of the hot crime spots in the world. Getting robbed is just kind of something everyone is prepared for, emotionally at least. Guns aren't nearly as common as they are in America, and often I think they should be. I've never had much of a hard time in South Africa, and while I know a lot of people who have been severely affected by Johannesburg crime, I've always been pretty lucky. Nothing's ever happened to me other than attempts or close calls. That is, of course, until one night where I happened to be lost. South Africa is full of townships. They're basically settlements for anyone living at a level of poverty so appalling that it makes the American sponsor in African videos look like sponsor a Kardashian. I'm not even kidding. Here are some pictures for context. One of these townships, Alexandria, happens to be quite near a nice neighborhood where rich people stay. Big plots, big houses, etc. And a good friend of mine lives there. When I was 18, just having gotten my license, I decided to pop through to his house after going to a party with a few others. I didn't really know the way all too well if I wasn't leaving my house, but I knew that the basic idea was if I didn't go on the freeway, I'd have to go through Alexandria. And being an idiot, I figured I'd be just fine. I knew the area was dangerous as hell, but I kept getting lost and it didn't cross my mind. And so I arrive. It's dark as hell. There aren't any street lights, just some fires that people have started on the side of the road, and I'm feeling pretty scared as shit. It's pretty damn quiet and it was late for me to be driving through, about 11 p.m. I kept going straight on the main road hoping it would take me to the place where I was going, but as time wore on I noticed Limboro Park, the area I was talking about earlier, fading away. So I pulled a few funky turns. Taking a left, I catch something in my headlights that scares me this. This dude who looks like a hobo, beanie, rags, is carrying a full f deer across the street. It's dead. It looks like it's rotting, unsettling as f I break to let him cross and then slowly stroll past and keep an eye on him. As soon as he reaches the other side, he pulls out a hatchet and starts hacking the deer up. Needless to say, I was terrified, but I don't read into it too much. Poor people will eat whatever they can and I'm pretty sure he was just going to eat whatever meat he could get off the deer. Keep driving and start heading down the way I came and I'm starting to regret coming here. Still no street lights, hardly any cars passing, just guys on the side of the road with fires lit and they all eyed me out. I probably should have mentioned this earlier for context. White people do not go to Alexandria. That's not me being racist, it's merely fact. The white people who are in poverty in South Africa live like American trailer trash, whereas the truly impoverished black South Americans settle in the townships. And it's just not normal to see a white person there. Furthermore, my car was a black BMW 325ci, which is a pretty awesome car amongst the South African community, and I had a lot of people warning me that I'd be specifically targeted for a hijacking or whatever but I only shrugged it off because I never had any reason to care. My car also had the tendency to overheat. Back to topic. I drive past a group of guys sitting all around the fire in a trash can, and as I drive past, they turn and look at me. I'm taking it pretty slow. Two blocks down and I'm in a dead end street, and my car's heat gauge heads over into the red. The only word going through my head is fuck, 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 and I pull over and kill the engine and lights. It's pitch black, but I can make out a few flickering lights be it from the fires or electricity in my rear view. It didn't really look like anyone was going around, so I felt okay. But I knew I had to wait a good 20 minutes before starting up my car again. I started doing random shit and tried to get a handle on the heat problem like an open bleeder. My phone had about 30% battery still, but cut out for no damn reason while I was using the flashlight. So no phone, no car, in Alexandria. Then I hear something that made me shit myself. Not like a sudden off, right? 
but my heart just sank and I felt like puking. I looked down the road and I can barely make him out, but there's a black dude walking towards me and he's dragging a pole along the street so I can hear the clanking sound while it rubs against the tar. Now that's a pretty obvious sign that he's not just gonna stop and say hello, and I'm shitting myself. On the bright side, I have had a lot of weird slash violent confrontations and almost getting mugged, so I had handled it before. It's just that this time, I was in the middle of nowhere and I was basically a fucking pariah. So I stand there, stupidly. And then I figure my only option is to make a friend. So as he gets close, dragging his pole along, I decide to act my ass off. I quickly noticed that running would do me no good. I'd probably just get murdered somewhere if I did, and then I'd have no car, and if I stayed, I risked both. But fuck it. I put on a big smile, put my hand out for a handshake, and say, Hey, what's up, buddy? How's it going? Don't worry about the car. Just a little bit of heat problem. He looks a little confused and kind of pissed off, and I'm almost certain that he's just gonna whack the shit out of me with that pole. But I seriously feel like there's nothing else I can do. If I leave my car, I'll probably die in f***ing Alexandria. I might as well stay put. So I pull out my cigarettes and I offer him one, which was the first time I was really, really glad to be a smoker. I asked him for his name. He kindly grunts. It's Leppo, or one of those weird clicking names as he grabs a cigarette. And when I light it for him, I see his eyes are bloodshot as hell, and overall he just looks like a man in not good health. I take a look at his pole and ask him, you know, like, why the fuck do you have a pole? Only I word it better. He grumbles a little bit, but I make it out. I, it's dangerous out here. The robbers and rapists and whatnot. I figure I need a good deal of bullshit because I just get a terrible fucking vibe from being here and from this gentleman now leaning against my car. Oh, well, you can feel safe here, I say. And I try to put some, I don't really know how to say this. I try to make it sound scary, which I can do pretty well. My voice is pretty commanding, but at this point, I actually want to scare him enough that he'll back off. I think it worked because he looks at me and his eyes are kind of shifty and he says, why? And I smile and say, I've got a gun on me. And I lift my shirt a bit at the back where he can't see it. On the inside, I have a mix of emotions. Half of me is high-fiving the shit out of me because I think it's actually working. And the other half is expecting him to call my bullshit, take it as a threat, or just get pissed off. But he looks at me and I can tell he's a little freaked out. And he starts making small talk as we finish our cigarettes. He asks what I'm doing in Alex. Fair question. I tell him I got lost and leave it at that. I feel a little bit calmer now. He kills his cigarette and I really want to check on my car, but I'm not stupid enough to turn my back and look at the engine while he stands there. I shake his hand and say, All right, thanks for the company, but it's not safe here. I think you should go. It was such an act on my part that I can't believe I pulled it off, but he says okay and walks away, pole in hand, and when I see he's gone, I turn back to my car and take the biggest fucking sigh of relief ever. Now fortunately, the heat was back to normal. Unfortunately, my story doesn't stop there, but I'm not writing a book. And I'm over 1,500 words in, so I'll leave it at that for now. I was pretty surprised when people took interest in this. I wasn't expecting it. The second half of this story gets f weird, and the third part is even worse. It was one of those nights that made me question whether the paranormal was possible, because for this much to go wrong in a space of nine hours makes no fucking sense to me. But you asked for it. Here it is, unadulterated. In Alexandria, it made sense that shit went wrong. I just so did not fit in there, especially at night. But I guess I'm gonna keep going and fill you guys in on what was questionably the scariest slash weirdest slash at times interesting night of my life. The worst part is, it didn't stop until I got home. And getting home took me a long ass time. So I start my car back up. And at this point, I'm so freaked out that my leg is shaking on the clutch when I pull off. I also expect my car is going to overheat pretty soon unless I manage to find a petrol station and get some water put in my tank. So at no point do I get to calm down in any of this. On the bright side, I was pretty sure I was heading in the right direction. I could see the highway coming into view. Now, you know how when horses are close to home and they start going really fast? I did that. I actually had pretty good reasoning at the time. My car cools down when I drive faster. So I sped up and I hit a massive ditch in the road. The car made it out, thank God. But on top of heating problems, I didn't want to have to go and look. And the road ahead of me was still dark as fuck. But I heard the front of my car hitting the road I'm worried about damage, so with a f my life, I step out the car and check it out. The bumper was a little messed up, but nothing too bad. I realize they keep going back and adding context, but this is also important to note. Up until I turned 20, I had the worst luck with cars. Breaking down was part of a Saturday night for me, so I wasn't entirely useless at evaluating slash fixing things that went wrong. So far, from what I could tell, 
there wasn't anything notably wrong with my car, other than some exterior damage. I scout the area a bit, and it looks safe, so I head back to my car and open the door. Then I get one of them, ah, type of frights when I hear screaming off in the distance. It felt like Sin City only in a more rural, scary-ass area. If God exists, I swear he was toying with me because like a goddamn horror movie. I hear the screams of a woman followed by a dog barking, then a baby crying, and an angry man. But I hop back in and drive on. Because of the left turn I took earlier, I know I was supposed to pull a little left-right to get back onto the main road that got me into all this. And then I could just play it safe, get to a gas station, and back on the highway. But going straight, parallel to the main road, took me to a dead end. So imagine that between all the shitty houses and barely tarred roads, there's this white cement barrier blocking the road off, and about six to seven dudes with a fire sitting on top of it, chilling, drinking beers, and eating a f***ing deer. I don't know if it was the same guy from earlier. Might have been, might have not been. Overall, a lot of the incidents of this evening, I try to put down this stupid ass coincidence. Anyways, I try to catch them in my headlights and keep calm, because all I have to do is turn around and get back onto the main road. They're eyeing me out. I wouldn't even say that in a bad way, they're just looking at me. And having been given enough reason to shit myself that night, this only made it worse. Because at the time, I was pretty sure that they wanted to f- me. I pulled a turnaround motion and speed off. And I really hated my life at that moment. Because there went the heat gauge. I was used to that. Usually if my car dripped out, I'd have to go for a few minutes, stop for a few minutes to get anywhere that wasn't abnormal. But on this particular day, I just wanted to fucking get home and my car was not having it. I ran it through the red line for a little bit and just tried to distance myself from people. Anyway, so I figure I'm in the clear. I just let my car overheat for a while and hope I don't get murdered. Open the trunk, open the bleeder. It's a little screw by the water tanks of BMWs that let you take the pressure out. And step back in while I wait. In my rearview mirror, I see the dudes walking up towards me. I don't immediately assume the worst. I obviously grant credit to the possibility that they are sinister but it seems about as likely that they just want to help. I don't fucking know, but they come up to me. You have to understand that at this point, I've had the worst night ever and I just feel utterly pathetic, like I'm done trying. If you're scared for long enough, you tend to just embrace it, like a seeming pile of that's been in your living room for years and is so stuck to the carpet that you just learn to get along with it, watching TV, nostrils full of shit and all. So they come up and I give a half-hearted, hi, they're pretty cool. How's it, what's up with your car? I give them the story and they tell me Alexandria is pretty dangerous and that they'll stick with me until I'm ready to go. They offer for me to go to the fire with them, but I decline because holy shit no. I can't say I got a bad vibe from them though. All in all, they seemed pretty nice and wanted to make sure that I was safe. So we did some talking, smoked some cigarettes. Most of them were just getting blazed Snoop Lion style. From the other end of the road, the way it came down that led me to the dead end, another group of dudes are walking up. It must be 12. 12.30 a.m. by this point, and I can't fathom why anyone would be walking around so late, but whatever. I'm gonna call them group two for reference, and the first group, group one. I'm not very creative. Anyways, I understand the language somewhat. Not well enough to speak much, but I can understand it enough to make out what happened. Here's how the conversation runs after pleasantries. Group two. What's up with Whitey? Turns and said hi to me in English. Group one. Car broke down. Something something white people and car problems. Group two. Something something, car something can take it. Group one, nah, he's a brother. Something along these lines, my translation wasn't spot on. Group two, that boy? There's no way he's a brother. Group one, skipping some in between talk here. What do you wanna do? Group two, freak him out and take his car. Something something, gun. I've kinda had enough of this. Group one was nice enough to stand up for me, but I'm not really the kind of guy who lets things go by. And sometimes I really wish I was, because it might keep me out of trouble. But in this case, I think I did the right thing. So I tap one of the guys next to me, a guy from my group, and say, Did he want to see my gun? He looks at me and says, You have a gun? I motion for him to keep it down and tell him I've got it in the car if we need to use it. He taps his buddy on the shoulder and whispers something. He tells group two that I've got a gun. I don't. And that they should lay off. It's not going too well. Group two kind of grunts and keeps walking. A few of them trying to shake my hand as they do, but fuck that. I was a little too cocky and eyeing them down though. To me it made sense. They were just conspiring to rob me, then smile and wave as they walk past. But the last guy stops and says, What? You don't want to shake my hand? So I look around a bit and figure out what I'm going to say. I speak Zulu. 
They all bust out laughing in group two asks what I heard. I tell them succinctly and they all laugh a little more. The dude who was fronting on me laughs, pats me on the back and says, ah, all right, brother, and they head off. One of the guys from group one was nice enough to get me some water for the car and they helped me fill up and gave me some directions to where I'm going. Fuck yeah. I say my thanks and goodbyes and drive off after a little while of making sure everything was sorted. Pretty confident now. My car won't overheat if I've done the water properly, so I should be fine. And finally, I know where I'm going and it's super fucking simple. I make it out of Alexandria and the story continues after that, but I guess you guys wanted the full story, so here's what I saw on the way out. Two things to note, and I still have a hard time believing that I could have so much fucked up shit happen in one night, but then again, I'm not really a patron of Alexandria. My friends have told me some fucked up stories about life in township, particularly one night. First thing is easier to talk about. I come up to a T-junction, just like my friendly protector said I would. But when my lights are shining down, I see something kind of weird, something moving. Not exactly in line with my lights, but between two houses just off of this side. And there's a pretty small crack between them. So I squint and I look really close and no, what the? Yep, that's a man sucking another man's dick. So that's something I never wanted to see in person, or on video, but fine. The image lingered around for a bit, but it wasn't frightening or anything. But the next thing was pretty fucking terrifying. There was a little clearing, which is weird because Alexandria is like Tokyo building density, but there was this random spot of soil where a full on bonfire was going. Describing this is kind of tricky because I'd never seen it before. I haven't seen it since and I know fuck all about it. And I'm pretty sure it's just not a normal part of South African culture. But there were people singing and dancing while they made their way around the fire and a few of them were screaming. But there was this dude on the floor, might have been a woman, couldn't really see, screaming his ass off, legs spread open, facing out, up, with a white tribal mask on, screaming and screaming, right in front of the fire, while everyone danced around him. Fuck me about six blocks and I was out of Alexandria. I looped straight onto the road to Limboro Park and came to a stop at the intersection. Now I was really freaked out while I was there because the guy I was going to visit got jacked at the same spot not too long ago. Light turns green and I'm in the clear. Then I remember something. I don't have a fucking phone. I made it to my friend's house and I'm outside. The house itself isn't that big, but the plot is pretty massive. I'd say a kilometer, a half mile or so around, and the house is right at the fucking back. And the only way is to either call him on his phone or call loud enough that someone in the house wakes up. So I'm standing out, calling to him, and not a f***ing peep. It's dead silent. I'm worried about waking the neighbors, his parents, or anyone. And I'm just in a f***ing terrible mood at this point. In retrospect, I don't really know why I didn't just go home right then. But I think it had something to do with just feeling like I'd been through so much. Little did I know, I was in for even more. Writing this now, I realize I never told anyone this full story. Just bits. But holy shit, this night gets creepy. I drove to a nearby gas station. I say nearby. It was out of the neighborhood, over a bridge, and into the city that you'd expect halfway between Alexandria and a rich white folk with their equestrian estates and shit. It was Friday night, and I wasn't done just yet. I told the guy at the gas station about the heating trouble, and said I just want to leave it for a while and check on it later. I head inside buy some cigarettes and some Red Bull, and kind of just hang out eerily. I'm thinking, I need to make a phone call somehow, but asking around feels wrong. Plus the gas station is 100% dead. No watch, but I think it was near 2 a.m. After about 20 minutes, I figure it's safe to check. So I slowly undo the lid on the tank, and while I'm derping around with the radiator cables, a baki shows up. I don't know the American word for it. I guess truck? You know, those little cars with open backs that you can load shit into? Context. In South Africa, the Afrikaans people tend to drive backies, because for the most part, they do a lot of the labor and farming work. That's a stereotype, but in this case, it was accurate. They are blasting some dubstep type of music. They huddle out, probably drunk, laughing loudly, and go into the store. When they come out, I'm still knee-deep in my car, putting coolant in it with the petrol attendant, and they come up to me. They're wearing wife beaters and monster energy caps, jeans and flip-flops, both matching, and the way they approached me was not creepy. They kind of boxed me in from both sides and asked what trouble I was having. I tell them briefly, not paying much attention to them. And then, the one guy says, 
You know how dangerous it is out here? Some dude will come stab you and take your wallet. You live close by. Why don't you come stay with us? So my f***ing creeps lay off, please. Mood is setting in, and I just flat out say no. And I'm pretty aggressive about it. And then they go quiet. And I look up from my car and I see them both smiling at each other. And the other guy goes, I don't think you understand. And walks a little closer. I think you'll be much safer if you come with us. I'm pretty much done by this point. I'm done being nice or tactful to get through the night. I turn around, lean against the front of my car and tap my finger against my nose. I think you should f*** off. I say. They take it pretty well and back off without a word. I close my car up and start talking to the cast attendant about it. He agrees that it was pretty strange. I ask him if I can use his phone and he says sure. So to the random petrol attendant guy, thank you so much. I call my friend and he wakes up and I tell him as briefly as I can what happened, just minor details. He laughs and says he'll wait outside for me in 15 minutes when I come over. He has a laugh over my weird ass night, but mid phone call I can hear him scream. You fucking cuff. Cuff is a really bad word in South Africa. Imagine on steroids. Seriously. Afrikaans farmers used to say it to the black slaves. And I remember that this is a lot closer to home than American slavery, considering the apartheid only really ended in 94. And the treatment was brutal as hell. Long story short, this word is f***ing serious, and it's not something you hear actors blurt out by mistake. It's just so taboo that hearing it makes me feel dirty. I tell my buddy I have to go, but I'll meet up with him soon. And the two African guys are roughing up the petrol attendant who was nice enough to keep me company and let me make a phone call. It's not terrible, but they're yelling right at his face and pushing him, and he's pretty visibly scared. I snap. I used to do a fair amount of fighting, and then one day I realized that I didn't want to be a dick, so I gave it up, and I hadn't thrown a punch since I was 16 by that time which was a pretty big deal for me considering I used to compete and when I wasn't competing, I was being a dick. But I snapped. I ran over with a scream that could have put King Leonidas to shame. They get a huge fright because I overpowered their racist yelling. I punched the first one with running force. The guy didn't even try and defend it. So I could tell they didn't really know what they were doing. I grabbed the other one and pull a headbutt because hey, it's f***ing late. They're both on the floor, not unconscious, but I'm so not interested in them that I turn away. I take the petrol attendant and make sure he's okay. He's just thanking me. Then I get hit by what feels like a f***ing hammer in the back of my head. I drop down, quickly turn around, and sure enough, the two of them are back on their feet. I put my legs up and kind of guard from a few half-assed kicks and think it's over. I really didn't feel like fighting. The main reason I stopped is that my adrenaline rushes would make me feel like I was puking and crying for no damn reason, and I'm kind of feeling a combination of that rage by now. Finally, I say, Listen, I'm going to jump to my feet now, and if you still want to be here when that happens, I'm not going to let you get back up. They back off. The one guy's face is bloody from the headbutt already. They get in their car and say, We're coming back for you in that f***ing of I'm not too worried because I'm going to leave soon. And it's not likely they're going to follow me, right? I tell the petrol attendant to tell the cops and wait until they show up. They agree and keep an eye on things, but tell me that I shouldn't go off on my own. I insist I'll be fine. I pull out and head back the way I came. I cross back over the highway, but just before I do, I notice a car behind me doing a U-turn so that it's right behind me. But again, I pass it off as coincidence. I was actually feeling pretty calm by this point. I think I got a lot of the anger out on the racist guys from earlier. My head is pounding a bit from the blow, but it's not too bad. I turn my indicator on and he mimics me. I take a closer look at the car and sure enough, it's a Baki. I can't make out the faces of the drivers, but there are definitely at least two guys sitting in the back. So now I'm on this tiny, one lane road that leads around Limboro Park because the main road is closed off. Limboro Park is also as quiet as a neighborhood gets, so I'm not gonna run into anyone who's gonna help me. I'm pretty obviously being tailed right now. I rev my car as fast as I can. I'm not a great driver, but my car is obviously faster than whatever they were rolling with. I take the corner while shitting myself that I'm gonna spin out or flip over, and I'm sitting a decent amount of distance, but they're definitely trying to speed up and follow me. I go down the first actual Limboro Park road kill my lights and make a right turn, which happens to be the road to my buddy's house. I kill the engine and park under a tree because that shit always works in need for speed. Meanwhile, they roll past slowly and see my car so they make the turn. I call myself a retard and quickly start up and drive off again. My buddy Gordon isn't outside like he said he'd be, so I literally have nothing to do other than circle around a bit. They start yelling and waving cricket bats around and I'm kind of in fight or flight mode, not so much analyzing what's going on in my head. After about three trips around the block and a bunch of screaming later, Gordon is finally outside. 
I quickly loop my car into their driveway and jump out and close the gate. The rednecks stop their car, get out, and start banging on the gate. Gordon is massive. He's got that archetypical rugby player build. 6'5", at least 130 kilograms, most of it muscle. He asks me what the fuck is going on and I tell him that. Some assholes were roughing up a gas attendant and now they're pissed off at me because Princess over there bleeds too easily. South African gates are pretty secure because me, crime, Gordon's family had a lot of break-ins. And they made the place like Fort Knox with a crazy electric fence, so they can't get past, but they can yell and be obnoxious. Gordon sizes them up and tells me that there's only four of them, and we could probably take them. I tell him it's not fucking worth it, and we could just call the cops. He laughs and tells me to wait there. I'm not happy with it, but he drives my car up the long driveway while I sit there and listen to four dudes being pissed off. It's actually kind of funny, in retrospect, because all they wanted to do was beat me to a pulp but the gate was too much of an issue. It takes forever, but Gordon finally gets back. It takes forever, but Gordon finally gets back. He steps out the car with a big grin and starts firing his paintball gun. It wasn't just one of those normal shitty ones. He spent about $500 on a ridiculous handheld gun that looks like something out of Halo. He also had it loaded with pepper and rubber bullets for a whole 30 clip magazine. It also had a daddy gas canister on it. Gordon pelts them a few times and the pepper spray bullets really get them coughing. They get into their car, pull their wife beaters over their mouths, whatever, and drive off. The funny thing is, the pepper spray worked so well that they couldn't even yell anything as they drove off. They just flipped us the bird and... Ah. Gordon was laughing his ass off, and I can't blame him. But I was honestly so full of terror, anger, confusion, and all around this world to really find a humor in it. I told him some of what happened, what I remembered. Truthfully, though, he missed out on a lot of the details. A lot. So Reddit is the first to ever hear the full story of the most consistently f***ed up night. I got inside, it was 4am, and I had the most deserved beer of my entire f***ing life. Now, have you ever seen one of those horror movies where everything seems to be sorted out, and they drag the storyline out for no f***ing reason, and you're just like, please, can this shitty movie end? Yeah. That's about to happen. Okay. Here it is. The final part of the story. I've already pointed out how weird it is that all of a sudden the entire universe seemingly wanted this shit on me, so I won't elaborate on that any further. I'm at Gordon's house now, drinking a beer, and I tell him about my night, albeit forgetting several details. We laugh it off and he tells me that he has an old school friend staying over there, Jason. I know Jason pretty well. We all used to play computer games together, and he was always an odd guy. And that only got worse as he got older. He just gave off really weird vibes when he spoke, and he was socially awkward as hell. I'm socially awkward, but he made me look pretty normal. I ask about him and Gordon tells me that he's been really strange. He's sleeping upstairs now though, so I don't have to worry. I kept shooting the sh and I'm a few beers down when Jason comes downstairs, looking all tired and dazed. I say, hey, you speak a little bit? It's about 5.30 a.m. when I decide I should get some sleep. Also, beer makes me tired as f so I tell Gordon and he takes me to the spare bedroom. Jason has the room next to mine, and he goes into it. I say goodnight and lie down in bed, but before even a few seconds have passed, Jason comes in. I realize that he's drunk as f and even though he'd slept a bit, he still smelled like alcohol and was all woozy, so I wasn't taking him too seriously. He sits on the side of the bed and starts telling me about how shit his life has been, and I'm just kind of like, yeah, that's cool. He'd recently been through a breakup, and he tells me that when he was having sex with his girlfriend, she would just sort of lie there, a limp fish, and when he was done, she'd never want to cuddle. I find this f hilarious. He said it with so much passion, like he really, really wanted his ex-girlfriend to cuddle with him post-coitus. Not that there's anything wrong with that, it's just not something the guys blurt out on the usual basis. So I burst out laughing and he says, don't you fucking laugh. I kept laughing because I genuinely think he's still rolling with the joke, and he turns to me and says, Stop fucking laughing. It isn't fucking funny. I take the hint and stop laughing. Then I say, Sorry dude, I've had a bit of a f***ed up night. I really just want to sleep. And he says, So sleep then. Still just chilling on the side of the bed. I'm not going to sleep with you here. Get out. I say in a pretty friendly way. I don't know what happened next. I don't know if he was just being drunk or passing out, or him doing it intentionally, but he collapsed on me. I throw him off, and he lands on the side of the bed and just straight up jumps on top of me. Me and Gordon went to school with this guy, and he used to do a lot of play fighting or whatever, 
you know, wrestling type shit. And I assume he's doing that. Despite me telling him that all I want to do is fucking sleep, he keeps jumping on me or trying to wrestle my head or some shit. So eventually, I get really pissed off and decide to really hurt him. He's basically lying on top of me, not doing much or anything. So I grab him by the shirt and lift him, just push him into the wall. His head hit pretty hard and he yells, Ow, f I'm not that angry, but I say, Dude, get the f out. I really want to sleep. He walks towards the door, opens it, and then he says, I shit you not. I'm going to slit your throat in your sleep. F this sh. I face palm and he walks out. I get up and figure there's no fing way I'm sleeping here. Not on a night like this. I'm going to go home, something I should have done hours ago. I go to Gordon's room and I wake him up. I tell him what happened and say I'm just over the entire night and want to go home. He tells me it'll be better if I just stick it out. It's still dark and some sleep will do me good. He has another bed in his room and he can just lock the door. So I agree. He locks up and we go to sleep. Q 7 a.m. Someone's knocking on the door. Gordon doesn't wake up, but I do and just kind of walks over in my zombie-like, still sleeping days and open up. There's Jason, standing. Just standing there, head down. I have a few questions about this. Why is he standing there? Did he sleep at all? He probably tried to check the room to see if he could kill me. He doesn't say or do anything. And I'm still stuck in that overwhelm. Like I've spent too much time being scared to feel scared so much that just wanting to puke and then sleep because I really think that's what I need more than anything right now. So I give it a few seconds. And I shut the door and lock it. He does the worst thing he could possibly do. Nothing. If he knocked again, I'd get it. But this seemed like some paranormal activity type shit. I'm lying in bed and I realize sleep isn't gonna happen. So I'm basically staring at the ceiling. It's also starting to get fucking cold and it's really foggy outside. Gordon's room has a balcony with a glass window that looks out into the garden, which is massive. So I'm kind of checking it out. Cause looking out and breathing was the only thing that could make me feel normal for a few moments. I slip my shoes on, grab a jacket out of Gordon's cupboard, and step outside. It had that crisp, cold morning air to it, and to be honest, for those few moments, I really felt okay. Even a little bit peaceful. I have a cigarette and I watch the fog drift around. I head back inside after a few minutes and lie down under the blanket, cold as fuck, waiting for it to warm up. When I look over the window and, goddamn fucking Jason is just standing there, just creeping. I ask what the fuck he's doing, and he says, let me in. So I do. He steps in and sits down, and I just can't resist asking what's wrong with him. He tells me about how upset he is about his girlfriend. And I listen, and I tell him I totally get what he's going through, but he's turning into a creep. He agreed, and we actually had a nice talk. I ended up taking him out a few weeks later to talk to random people and get him out of his shell a little bit. It didn't work, but it was funny as hell to watch. And it makes me feel really bad to say it, but... It was just really, really good cringe humor. Anyways, Jason isn't really a concern anymore. It's also early in the morning, sun is up, and I'm clearly not allowed to sleep. So I head downstairs and raid Gordon's fridge for more beer. Whenever we visit each other, the fridge and pantry are free game, so I'm making myself some breakfast and talking to Jason trying to cheer him up. And Gordon's parents wake up and come downstairs. I say hey, they leave pretty soon after, and I ask Jason to grab the remote to let me out. Things finally seem pretty calm. It's about 8.30 a.m. now. I drive out and head home. Skipping Alexandria by taking the highway to my house is only 10 minutes away or so. There are two routes I can take home, and I usually switch it up based on whatever one ends up happening randomly. And on this particular day, I drive down a long road that winds down a mountain pass. So a long, windy, narrow road. Right before that though, I drive past a small blue Daihatsu stopped, not exactly in the middle of the road, but enough to block the one lane so people driving past are slowing down and hooting because it's just annoying. I join the angry mob and give the guy a bit of horn action as I drive past, but I notice he's sleeping. He looks full on passed out, and this is a pretty busy street. I'm worried he's diabetic and randomly fainted or something, so I pull over in a little parking spot and walk over to him. I also noticed there was another Red Bull lying in my car, so score. I walk up to him and he's got his window open, chair all the way back just sleeping. I get closer. The car smells like shit. This smell hits my face and I genuinely think this fucker shit himself and is sitting in it. There are crumbs all over his jacket and empty plastic bags scattered across the car. I snoo for at least a minute before noticing that he's been staring at me this whole fucking time. Pretty average looking dude. Late 20s, early 30s. I thought he was sleeping. 
So after silently screaming like a little girl, I say, Oh shit, I thought you were asleep. Sorry. He smiles. And I'll never forget how creepy his smile was. Imagine a dude who smelled like shit in a tiny little blue datsu smiling at you like he was the Mona Lisa. I can't describe it. And he says, No, I'm not sleeping. A little lost for words, I point out that he's kind of in the middle of the road and I ask if he's feeling alright. He keeps up that smile and says, Don't worry about it. You have a good day now. His voice was soft and empathetic. Pedo fashion. It was just really creepy. I decided to let it go and walk away. But I just get this feeling that he's going to follow me. I remember that I'm in South Africa, and in South Africa, it's kind of a hijacking routine for someone to lie out on the middle of the street playing dead, so that when you go to help them, someone just jumps into your car and buzzes out. There are some pretty elaborate schemes to steal your shit, so I think I've just fallen for one. I'm walking to my car, and when I look back, he's walking behind me. I get to my car, turn around, and watch him. He stops right in front of me, not saying a word. That smell follows him. I'm pretty sure he was on drugs, but seriously, what drug does that? He wasn't cocaine active. He seemed maybe a little doped out, but there was something more. Maybe opiates and alcohol? I don't f***ing know and I'm still sticking to my story when I say he shot himself because that smell followed him. He doesn't say anything. So I do. What? The smile came back. Nothing. I heave a sigh and get in my car. As I drive off, he puts his hand through my open window and tries to hold on. But it's so half-assed that he doesn't even step to keep up with me. And I just drive on. I don't really know what he was doing. I don't know what he wanted, and honestly, I don't care. For all I know, the armed guard could have been behind me at that point, and I wouldn't have cared. Home was just a few blocks away. I made it. I finally had fucking made it. I opened the garage and parked my car. I closed the garage and no one had crept in. I took a deep breath and I had trouble believing that I was actually home. It was fucking beautiful. I never appreciated having a home before, a place that is just safe. So I did the only logical thing I could do. I went to the kitchen, and I had a double whiskey. I had a beer, and I had a glass of red wine. Then I passed the f*** out. I slept until about 10 p.m., and then I lazily drifted in bed and watched movies and sh**. It was beautiful, and there was no creeps. I charged my phone, I told my mom I loved her. I never even told anyone what happened. I told them a few parts, but seriously, who the f*** believed that all this happened in the space of less than 12 hours? I didn't go out for a long time after that. It seemed like everything in the world would just go wrong. I was terrified. And I still think I was justified in not really trusting the world for a while after. However, I did notice one thing. It prompted a lot of what happened. The way I was raised, my brother and I were expected to be staunch and masculine. Never back down type of thing. We went to boarding schools, along with Gordon, which explains why he was so happy to just fight the four guys. They made some amazing stories on their own. But the whole mentality we were groomed into was that if you ever got angry with someone and didn't do anything about it, you're a p That attitude has its place. But if I hadn't been so damn stubborn about giving Jason shit, giving Group 2 shit, giving the Afrikaners at the gas station shit, and finding out why the Diatsu man was sleeping, that night wouldn't have been so f***ing eerie. That attitude has its place, but I had to tone it down a lot. In a way, it's a little sad, because honestly, if I see someone in trouble, I'd love to go up and help them. But most of the time, I can't find it in me anymore. Because they could just be full of shit. All in all, even though it's weird to say, that night really changed my life. I just chilled out after that. Not out of fear. Well, first out of fear. But later it was because it felt easier and more natural. So I've made a full recovery, I think. And the story is pretty damn cool. Also, I think I got all my creep experiences over and done with that night. Because it hasn't happened since. Let me know if you guys have any questions. And once again, thank you all for taking so much interest in it. Colt Yard Cell. The few people that have told this story always laugh it off or tease me, but I swear on my life that it's true. I've always loved yard cells. In the summer when I have a free day, I'll often just drive around all day looking for different yard sales, wasting my day away. About two years ago, I was doing this, just driving around looking for yard sale signs, gradually going further out into the rural country and enjoying the scenery, having fun getting lost on the back country roads. You can sometimes find great yard sales doing this. I saw a yard sale sign off of the road 
next to a big rock with something religious carved into it like churches have. I can't for the life of me remember what it said. God's haven, something religious. I can't remember. Anyway, I figure it's probably got some good stuff if it's a church organization, so I decide to go. I turn my new Jeep down the long, narrow gravel driveway, and the trees open up to a clearing with a really beautiful white house. They have long tables spread out with folded clothes, kid toys, etc., but nothing I was really interested in. There are probably about 30 people milling about on the property. They are all wearing these gray jumpsuits. Um, okay. The only other person that seems to be browsing through their wares was this old man, whose truck was also parked there, but we were the only ones not wearing gray jumpsuits. The woman at the makeshift table with the money box on it begins talking to me as I'm preparing to leave. I stride over to her for a friendly chat. I notice that behind the house, there are probably 10 or so small gray buildings that the gray jumpsuits are going in and out of. After some casual chat, she notices me staring. Yes, we all live here. It's great. Hey, would you like to come in and learn more? She had this crazy light in her eyes when she nodded at three guys who had been arranging stuff on tables, moving tables, etc. And they all came to stand around me. Really, come inside. We preach peace and the word of God. You'd really like it. She took my hand and kind of started tugging me towards the house. All the while, these guys are following and I'm making weak protest. Then, the old man who had been browsing paperbacks seems to take notice and comes up. He looks at the woman and says, Sorry, ma'am, we both really have to get going. I don't think she's interested. The woman looks shocked, but let's go. And the guy steps back. He's a scrawny old guy, and I'm a petite woman. But that badass old man grabs my arm and hustles me over to my Jeep. And as I'm thanking him and yelling back at the people to have good luck with their yard sale, he mutters in a low voice, really need to get out of here. My hands are shaking. All the great jumpsuits are just turned and silently staring at us. I'm fumbling with my keys. The old man stands by my rolled down window and I fumble back to start my car. The old man stands by my rolled down window and I fumble to start the car and try to back out of the narrow gravel driveway. I try to do a three point turn but my car slides down in the gravel into a shallow ditch next to the driveway and I'm panicking. Just take it easy, put it in four wheel drive, he coaxes. I don't know how, I whisper frantically. I'd only had the G for a couple months at this point and I had never had a car with four wheel drive before. I figure I'd learn eventually. He calmly told me how to do it and stood there guiding me as I finally got the Jeep to stop sinking into the gravel and drove the hell out of there. I yelled a thank you to him and he nodded before getting back in his truck. I told my family and a few friends who kind of laughed at it and brushed it off, saying they hadn't heard of any cults in this area, probably just a church cell at one of the members' houses. I've driven around that area a little bit after the event. But I haven't seen that rock sign thing again. Though honestly, that day I drove pretty deep into rural country. I had no idea what road or where I was. I just knew the general direction to drive in to get back on the main road. And eventually find my way home. I think I may have escaped some cold that is kind of off the radar. But I swear to God it happened. Thank God that old man helped me get out of there. I live below a cult leader. I fear I've angered her. I... 28-year-old female, have lived in the same apartment for four years. My neighbors in the unit above me are a couple in their 30s who have lived there for about three years with no issues between us. During the past six months, I've noticed some changes in their behaviors. At first, it was just a few days per week. I'd hear music with heavy bass accompanied by rhythmic jumping. I'd assume they'd bought an exercise bike or something. But sometimes, the jumping gets so intense that it shakes my overhead and light fixture. The jumping routine has been escalating to the point that it takes place every day, normally between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. I also noticed that they called 1-800-JUNK and got rid of a lot of nice possessions. However, I figured none of this was my business, so I kept my observations to myself. About three weeks ago, everything escalated, multiple times per week, on weekdays and during working hours. It sounds like they're hosting a mini Burning Man event in their apartment. The music is so loud and clear that it sounds as if I'm at a concert while sitting in my living room. There's clearly a lot of people involved because the jumping and stomping shakes multiple light fixtures and cabinets. The music is a mix of new age slash spiritual vibes, dance beats, and a male voiceover giving weird instructions like, rebrand yourself, surrender yourself, stomp, stomp in response. I've taken audio recordings on my phone and one video from the hallway during these events.
still didn't complain to the building, but I wanted evidence in case it became a regular thing. This week, I've encountered a big problem. A couple above me has a private patio, which is directly above my bedroom. I came home from a three-day trip out of town yesterday. My ceiling is legitimately collapsing in one corner. Big chunks of plaster have fallen onto the ground. I saw a little water. I immediately called my superintendent since I don't want to get buried alive by ceiling rubble if it gives out. When he came to check it out, he was shocked and pissed. He said that the woman in the couple appears to be working with some people, doing workshops or something. He can see their patio from his apartment window and has watched the group do these dancing plus jumping plus dirt rituals out there on a weekly basis. He said that they dance and jump to the music and then spread dirt along with something else. He doesn't know what it is. He believes that the dirt plus wooden substance combo is getting through the wooden cracks, absorbing water and weighing down my ceiling. In order to fix the problem, my super said he had to go talk to the woman, check out her patio, and ultimately hire a contractor to pull the wood and scrape out whatever the hell is causing my ceiling to fall. I could hear them talking from my room, and the woman sounded distraught and defensive. When my superintendent left, he called me and warned me that she might try to come down to my apartment and demand to see the damage, but don't let her in. This was a little concerning to me. Is she a threat? The damage is real. I wouldn't mind showing her. She started playing her music again relatively loud, kind of like a warning shot. I mentioned the music and jumping to the super and said I had audio recordings. He started begging me to send the evidence to the front office. It sounds as if he wants him evicted. I said, okay, sure. I hate to be a rat, but if I have to choose sides, I'll side with the building that dictates my annual rent price. He called me twice more that afternoon to confirm that I had shared my evidence, and I said yes. Shortly after everything went down, I left my apartment and ran an errand. The woman was outside just standing on the sidewalk and stared at me the whole time as I walked by. I ignored her. This isn't my fault. Now today, I went to run another quick errand in the neighborhood. When I returned, the couple was again standing on the sidewalk. Both of them this time followed me into the building and waited until I was opening my apartment door to confront me. They were both wearing creepy smiles. The woman has horse girl hair down to her waist and started interrogating me. They asked, Is your ceiling really collapsing? When did it start? Do you think it was related to the recent rainfall? Because our patio is just fine. I was a little uncomfortable. Were they waiting for me outside? How did they know I even left the building? Why were they both standing there? I've literally never seen them enter together in the three years of living here. But I have nothing to hide, so I confirmed the damage is pretty bad. I just don't want it to fall during the winter. I'm sorry for the inconvenience, but hopefully the work will be done quickly for everyone's sake. They seem satisfied enough, so I said have a good day and shut my door. I'm getting the sense that they're nervous about what the contractors will find when they tear open the patio. What the fuck is up with the dirt rituals? Who are these people she's working with? I don't know what they look like or why they're available to stomp around on weekdays. The repair work has started on both sides, but the contractors will come on Wednesday for the grand reveal of what's under the patio that's making my ceiling collapse. In the meantime, I feel like I need to be alert and keep my eye out for these people, as well as the couple. It's unusual for me to see them in general, especially twice in two days. They seem scared and in denial of the problem. They also literally ambushed me. Hopefully it's over soon. Update. The contractors came today and reported that there was in fact their end sludge visible below the neighbor's patio. However, thanks to the help of my internet sleuthing friend, I'm getting a lot more insight into the realm that dwells above me. As one Redditor suggested, nice work. My neighbor is affiliated with multiple ecstatic dance communities, both international and local. The international group has planned events during which all cells of the organization host dance sessions simultaneously. It also has a YouTube channel that streams Psytrance music 24-7. I've listened to a portion of it and a female voiceover declared, You are becoming the Game Master. Meanwhile, the local groups seem to be more exclusive and more radical in their mindset. One of the local groups, hosted by my neighbor's good friend, conducts three-day events that cost upwards of $400 for admission. Participation in all three days is mandatory. I get the impression that they all sleep in the studio space. And the event description mentions that it begins with a ritual. The last and darkest affiliation that I've confirmed via social media footprints is that my neighbors and a few members of the local communities are involved with some compassionate death groups. 
There's no way for me to verify at this time if these affiliations overlap in some meaningful way. So I will simply state the facts that I have evidence to prove. My super asked me about the jumping again when I saw him today. He remains eager to act. He agreed with my new game plan to wait for another large event to happen, and then call him to check on my dishwasher so he can intervene. So for now, the ways of which the puzzle pieces of ecstatic dance, compassionate death, patio dirt rituals, and ceiling collapses connect will remain a mystery. For those who are familiar with my unsettling neighborly encounters, and someone encouraging updates to share, on Monday, my super came to replaster my bedroom ceiling. First, he said that my neighbor told the contractor she has a lot of plants because she makes bush medicine. She's also told him that the dancing is part of her professional practice as a healer for people who are in bereavement after the loss of a loved one. So my friend and I weren't far off when we made the connection between her ecstatic dance and compassionate death affiliations. I showed him new cracks in the living room ceiling that are going in size and number by the day. He told me to send videos of the cracks to the building management. But management suggests I start with a handwritten note by their door explaining how their behaviors are wreaking havoc on my life. Since the super was working in my apartment, my neighbor was actively bumping music and jumping. I wrote a note in which I requested she reduce the volume of her music and be mindful of the intensity of her activities. I explained that the jumping or dancing was causing significant new cracks in my living room ceiling. I offered for her to speak with me directly if she needed. While I was reluctant to suggest this, I knew she might try another stalking trick if I didn't give her the option up front. So I sent her the note. After 90 minutes, my super said he had to leave for an hour while the plaster dried, but he would be back soon. Of course, my neighbor chose the end of this time frame to come down, when he was done. When I opened the door, she had again the biggest fake smile and said, Hi, then waved the note. First of all, she said, I want to thank you for your open communication. That is so important and rare in our city. Fake flattery. She admitted that she dances, which she has to do for her mental health. But she claimed that she only dances in the mornings for 30 to 60 minutes, 90 minutes max. I knew she was lying, so I said that her actions were affecting my mental health. She followed up with a range of excuses, including that they have been in the process of rearranging furniture, unpacking boxes, and that they sometimes watch movies in the evening with loudspeakers. I showed her the cracks that were immediately visible from the doorway area. She pointed to one and said, See, we used to have one table over there, but now we have two due to furniture rearranging. So maybe that's the reason? We also have cracks in our ceiling and, you know, we all have to share this space. I asked her about her hosting any large events in the past month, but she flat out denied. She quickly mentioned that she does sessions, but didn't elaborate further. The following suggestion, I later realized, was entrapment. My neighbor said that she would give me her phone number. My neighbor said she would give me her phone number, go upstairs, lower the volume. Then I should text her to let her know if I could still hear it. Thankfully, my super came back while she was in the process of sharing her contact information. She immediately tensed up, quickly gave the number, and then scurried off. As she passed my super, she randomly blurted out, We're best friends now, referring to me and her. My super and I were both very aware of the antics, so of course he didn't buy any of the manipulation tactic. I texted her that I couldn't hear the music now, to which she responded, So glad to hear that. Thanks again for opening a line of communication. I'm always happy to chat. Hope you have a lovely day. Prayer hands plus a heart emoji. In retrospect, I think she wasn't playing the music at all. I also felt like our conversation was riddled with gaslighting, misdirection, and flat out lies. I was somewhat confused, but I know what I've been experiencing and have plenty of evidence to prove it. Within hours of our conversation, my neighbor started up with loud music and dancing as if nothing happened. I was furious. I took new audio recordings and immediately emailed the building management with my new evidence footage of the ceiling cracks, along with a photo of my note. I explained that my neighbor was kind, though somewhat misleading, and expressed interest in accommodating my request. I also said that her behaviors were continuing as normal despite the false claims that she would take my experiences into account. The building manager said to keep her updated, but it was clear that she assumed the situation would be resolved on its own. Nope. My neighbor continued with the incessant bass-heavy music plus jumping shenanigans the next day, and the day after. I continued to document everything. On Wednesday evening, I went out for a quick errand and again was a victim of the stalking tricks. She ran into me as I was entering the building, waited until I passed on the stairwell, and then spoke up. She acknowledged that I've probably been hearing her activities the past couple days, and that I will continue to hear them for the next few days, all due to rearranging furniture. She said the coffee table had been sold that day. Not true. I was working in my living room all day, 
would have heard such a commotion in the stairwell. I said yes, I've been hearing her loud and clear. Shortly after this in-person encounter, a neighbor went on to host a party. I had heard people in the stairwell who seemed unfamiliar with whose apartment they were even visiting, and one guest introduced herself as a friend of someone else. While the music was much lower, the group began running back and forth overhead. Hearing the strange activities without the music was somewhat creepier than with the music. I took more recordings and retreated to my bedroom. But of course, the group decided to migrate to their patio, right above my head again. By 10.30 p.m., I had enough. They were no longer dancing, but the group's chatter along with ethereal music, a female soprano singing vocalizations, was too much. I sent her a text. I explained that I understand she has every right to host guests in her space. I explained that I understand she has every right to host guests in her space, but I was perturbed by the way she said to my face that any excess noise I might be hearing in the coming days was from rearranging furniture. I said I could hear the music and conversations very clearly, as the noise filters through my AC unit. I also said to please let me know if they'll be hosting any events in the future so I'm not caught off guard. But well, my neighbor didn't respond that night. Within minutes of me sending my message, the group began to sing the happy birthday song in the most somber way I've ever heard it sung. I was able to record the second half of it. They sang it in monotone. There was no clapping, cheering, or any standard signs of merriment that occur after the singing of this song. The following afternoon, my neighbor sent me a wall of text in which she continued to lie. She said that the gathering was very small. Only four friends, so it didn't even cross her mind to let me know when she saw me earlier. She said it was also the first time they had hosted more than two people this entire year. I honestly had to laugh at that. She said that when she first saw my text, they lowered the music and volume and told her friends to quiet down. So she admitted that she saw my message, but made no mention of any birthday affair. As for the furniture rearranging, she explained that it had been part of a long-term project and added more lies like how they had just received a dining table and bookshelf they'd been waiting for eight months. Not only would I have seen such large packages in the stairwell, but also I share so much irrelevant information if being truthful. Finally, I never said that they will be hosting two more events next week. Another small gathering of four friends next Wednesday, in honor of their partner's birthday, and a large gathering on Friday, again for his birthday. Like I said, she made no mention of singing happy birthday the night before, who would host three birthday parties over two weeks. It was all false. She followed up five minutes later with a second text that explained she was late to respond because she had been in back-to-back -back sessions. So I finally had written evidence of her talking about these sessions. They didn't respond to the text. I refused to engage her or her partner any further. They continued to play music and stop around that evening. But I had my boyfriend and a friend over who heard everything and validated to me that all of this is absolutely maddening. On Friday, I finally came to my building manager to explain everything. She needed to understand that something very strange and potentially dangerous is going on above me. Thankfully, I was finally believed. It turns out my building had no idea that she was running some form of business and hosting group events. I thought they at least had a vague awareness. The building manager said they would get an attorney involved ASAP to review their lease and contract and pursue action. She asked for all my evidence, including written communications, personal written account of verbal communications, audio recordings, and footage of ceiling damage. I've been taking videos of the ceiling cracks over the past few weeks to demonstrate how quickly they were growing. I made a Google folder that divided each category, dated every piece of evidence and sent. I was so relieved. It felt like some form of action was finally in motion. I assumed my building attorney was working on the case against them over the weekend, so I ignored their relentless music and jumping. But today, Sunday, my neighbors have been hosting another gathering since 11.30 a.m. I've been hearing heavy bass, sporadic jumping, and chatting on their patio for going on seven and a half hours now. While I've continued to collect my evidence, I decided to wait until tomorrow to check in with management. Around 5 p.m., I was quietly sitting on my couch when out of nowhere I heard the door open from above. Someone jogged down and then pounded on my front door. I didn't move a muscle. The person on the other side waited for about a minute. I thought I heard keys jingling. Then they slowly retreated back upstairs and shut the door again. Honestly, I have no idea what's going on now. The music and jumping increased after the knocking incident. Maybe they were testing if I was home, but I'm rattled by how I'm feeling watched when I'm minding my own business. At the same time, I want to keep laying low to protect myself. I still have very little information about this group. They're clearly escalating. Three events planned within one week, despite added pressure from everyone around them. Hey everyone, sorry for the delay. Last week was unexpectedly chaotic. 
so I figured I'd wait until I had a better handle on the current situation before updating. Tuesday evening, my boyfriend and I were making dinner when we began to hear a standard outburst of stomping and clomping overhead. While I've continued to document the most egregious incidents since building management promised to pursue legal action, I've also tried to block out some of the sounds for the sake of my mental health. My boyfriend pointed out the shenanigans from above. He was genuinely startled, to which I replied, I told you it's maddening. About 15 minutes after the upstairs settled down, my flimsy front doorbell rang. I crept over to look through the people and cringed. My neighbors were on the other side of the door, standing like statues with hands behind their backs and heads cast down. Their determined stance signaled that there was no way they would leave until I answered. If I chose to ignore, I knew they would either return, send a text, or stalk me on the street again. Since my boyfriend was present, I figured this confrontation was the safest option. So I waved him over with fear in my eyes that conveyed all he needed to know. When I opened the door, there were no fixed smiles. However, in typical fashion, my neighbors began the conversation with a misdirection. I just wanted to check in on you since you never responded to my text, said the woman. Or is there something in the language or keep in mind? Our final text exchange had been over two weeks prior, so I knew that was not the point of their visit. I told her the language was fine. I just didn't know what to say. From there, the gaslighting and denial campaign took off in full swing told my neighbors we had just heard the commotion minutes before their arrival, which elicited reactions of pure shock. We were just drinking tea. <laughs> yeah, we were just sitting on the couch drinking tea. The rest of the conversation, which I tried to end three times before they finally got to the point of their check-in, went similarly. Every statement I made was returned with expressions of bewilderment, as if I were speaking in tongues, and every response was riddled with lies. At times, the couple would accidentally contradict themselves, such as, that one Wednesday party was the first time we had people over in 2022. Since 2020. Right? Since 2020. And we didn't have any other parties that weekend. Especially not on Sunday. Sunday is when we have our dance class. Yeah, and we were hung over on that Sunday from our party. They also claimed that they were too old to be partiers. Even though they allegedly held three birthday parties in honor of the guy. Since my neighbor is a dancer, her body language became amusingly expressive. As if her motions would somehow sway my opinions. At one point... The woman would say, I think we should resolve this right now, while undulating her arms towards herself then in my direction. It looked like she was attempting to send energy waves to me. How about this? She proposed. How about one of you, you, motioning at my boyfriend with both arms open, come up to our apartment right now and walk around, swelling a finger in a clockwise motion circle above our heads. I could tell she really wanted to invite herself into my apartment but she sensed that that wasn't an option given my stoic demeanor throughout the entire pandering episode. I told her no. We were making dinner when they interrupted. At this point, my neighbor finally admitted why they had come. They said that they had received a letter that was aggressive and included additional wild accusations. The guy asked point blank, did you involve the building? I told them I did because I was confused and they had not listened to my requests. I also said that I genuinely don't know what the letter says. The building manager told me to tell them that it was in the hands of management now. Both members of the couple said, okay. I said, okay, and they awkwardly retreated upstairs. I shut the door, heart racing. I was so glad that my boyfriend was present to witness the gaslighting and validate me. Every time I interact with them, I'm less confused as to what was even said. Within 10 minutes of the confrontation, I receive a call from my super. He said, presumably after our talk. A couple called him and asked him, what's going on? He said, I don't know, I'm just a super. They asked to schedule a meeting with him. He declined. The following day, it was clear that the neighbors were not happy. The woman moved their speaker and subwoofer. Yes, they admitted they have a subwoofer in their apartment. Back into the living room and bumped it so loud that the glasses on my bar car were twinkling together rhythmically. I emailed the building manager with videos of the repaired ceiling, mentioning the confrontation, and attached a couple audio recordings of jumping that I had taken amid writing the note. It's true that neither my super nor I know the contents of the letter. Was it a warning or a notice that the eviction process would commence? But the building manager replied that she was sorry they came downstairs. She didn't understand why they felt they needed to confront anyone, and that hopefully the letter would do its job. While all of this sounds like I've made my situation worse, there's now a silver lining of hope. After the increase in music and jumping on Wednesdays and Thursdays, I noticed a stark change on Friday. I started to hear a commotion as if the couple was either soundproofing their entire unit or in the act of moving, think rearranging furniture. But for real this time, I heard items being dragged, loud bangs and a power drill, the moving style activities continued throughout the weekend, including Sunday morning when I saw a professional cleaner working in the building stairwell. I was leaving for a day trip. Of course, they would not be evicted at the drop of a hat. However, I think it's possible that the letter angered the couple enough to make an arrangement with the building. 
If they leave on their own terms, they won't be penalized for breaking the lease. The only other in-person encounter I've experienced since the confrontation was on Sunday evening. My boyfriend and I were unloading our friend's car, which was parked outside the apartment building after our day trip. It was taking some time since my boyfriend couldn't find my jacket he borrowed. Since I was preoccupied by the jacket, I didn't give any thought to the neighbors. Right as we geared up to shut the car doors and say our goodbye, I looked up to see my neighbors crossing the street about 15 feet in front of our car while holding hands. They both looked to their left and made brief eye contact with blank expressions and then continued forward. Naturally, this would be a coincidence. The front window of their apartment had a direct view of the street out front. It was also somewhat late to be going out on the Sunday and they didn't enter any of the businesses that are opposite of our building. If they had wanted to avoid me, I was quite suspicious while holding a pumpkin. They could have walked on the sidewalk behind us. I asked my boyfriend if he saw them too. He did. I'll ask my super if he knows any developments including a potential move. The neighbors are still here, obviously. But in the meantime, my ring camera has arrived. I'll be installing it outside my door this afternoon, which will give me a better sense of what's happening. I'll update again if I receive confirmation that they're heading out of the door once and for all. If they aren't, I expect my ring camera will provide evidence as to how many slash how often people are participating in the jumping routines. When I woke up this morning, I immediately heard some of my overhead lighting fixtures shaking as the neighbors danced music in hand drums with a singer shouting in a foreign language. So my torture continues, but the signs point to a peaceful, at least a peace restoring, resolution on the horizon. Strangers straight up tried to drown me. This took place about 10 years ago when I was a freshman in college. This is the first time I've recounted this story in full detail to anyone. I attend college in a rural mountain area in the Northeast, a small school tucked away in the rolling hills of the mountains. The type of place where the beauty and casual grace of nature is just opposed by the ugliness of humanity. The newspaper was ultra conservative and you couldn't sojourn too deeply into the woods beyond a few trees without seeing some type of meth activity. You know the type of place I mean. Anyway, one of my new friends from college discovered somehow an abandoned train trestle deep in the woods about five miles from campus, in no man's land basically. I don't remember how he found this place, because it's very much off the beaten path. The trestle crossed above the river which placidly flowed about 40 feet below. It was usually quiet and beautiful, and we began going there maybe three times a week, just chilling on the trestles, watching the water below and the open sky above. We drink 40s there, smoke a bowl there, bring girls there. We began jumping off the trestle into the water below and climbing back up. It was just a very college-y thing to do, our chill spot basically. So one day, just needing to get away from the dorms and away from it all, I decided to go by myself to the trestle for a swim. It was about 7 p.m., so I still had a good hour or so of dim sunlight, and I brought a flashlight for the walk home when it was sure to be dark. I made my trek through the pathways of woods as I had done a hundred times before, left my towel and flashlight on the trestle and jumped into the water. The water was about 10 or 15 deep, I'd say. It flowed almost imperceptibly. You might as well be swimming in a stagnant pool. However, maybe about 50 yards away from the trestle, the river narrows and the current picks up significantly. Then about 20 yards after that, there's a maybe 20 foot high waterfall that bubbles and splashes with extreme violence. We used to watch large objects go over and never come back up again. So there I am, dimly bobbing my head in and out of the water, doing underwater flips, etc. When I pop my head out the water, I happen to glance to the side of the river and see a man walking towards the water. The water is kind of impeding my view so I don't see him fluidly walking towards the water. I more see him in different stages of being closer to the water like flipping through a book. He's 15 feet away, 10 feet away, 5 feet away. He can barely give you a description. Maybe 6 feet tall, pale, skinny, black hair and pulled back in a ponytail. What I do remember the most about his appearance was the extremely empty look in his face and his eyes. Like he was doing something mundane. Taking out the trash or raking leaves. I'm treading water, not knowing what to think and see that he's no longer besides the river. He's dove in and his swimming pin straight directly towards me so fast, so fast. I try to swim the opposite way, but within a minute I can feel him grab my ankle and tug. I tried to scream, but the water filled my mouth. While I'm underwater, he lets go and goes up for air. 
and he grabs back on and pulls me again. It seems like he's done this before. I never once see him after he jumped in the water. He's gradually pulling me to where the current picks up before the waterfall. I start to realize this and just fucking flipping out. Kicking, screaming, cursing to no effect. Finally, I can feel the current start to take me, and I twist away towards the waterfall. I look back and see this. This fucking guy just casually swimming back to where he jumped in the water, not even looking at me. This is by far the scariest moment of my life as I approach the waterfall. Long story short, I go over and I'm underwater for a long time, over a minute. The water above unrelentingly pushing me under. The only reason I survived was there was a large log that had gone over and I grabbed it and leveraged it against the bottom to push me away from the crushing water. I survive, obviously. But then I had to trek miles back to my dorm, in the dark, without my flashlight. Every step of the way, I was thinking he would come back to finish the job. The next year, a football player drowned going over that fall. The news said it was because there was an extreme current due to the recent rainfall, but I've always wondered about that. Encounter with a serial killer. First off, this is my first post. I apologize for any faux pass, spelling slash grammatical errors. Second, understand that at the time this occurred, I was not living the healthiest of lifestyles. I quit using heroin when I was 25, and moved to France for five years. I just recently moved back to the States this past summer. This is relevant because it speaks to my mindset at the time that all this occurred and why I was comfortable taking the absurd risks I took. I was a drug fiend. Anyway, on to the story. When I was 20, I had moved to Baltimore to the Eastern Shore, thinking the distance would help mitigate my habit. Instead, I just ended up driving to Beemore every couple days and buying several hundred dollars worth of H instead of just buying less on a daily basis. In the process, I got to know a lot of odd people, some of them hacks. In Baltimore, a hack is someone who operates as a cabbie illegally. Often they take people into the city to pick up their drugs, or just charge half the rate of a legit cab driver. I had met an older guy at a Dunkin' Donuts on Donwalk who did this. Now, I wasn't in the habit of using hacks. But one night, my ride went down a one-way street the wrong way in front of a police officer, and we were pulled over and searched. It ends up the idiot had brought a stash of pot with him. So we were arrested and sent to BCDC. Oh God, I was pissed. Around midnight that night, they released me. It ends up that not only had my friend admitted ownership of the marijuana, but the reason they'd used to search us that his license was showing up as suspended was bull. My friend's lawyer had called them on it. So there I was, in the middle of Baltimore City, with no ride, nowhere to go, dope sick, in the middle of December. They released the men and women separately, and my friend's cell phone was still off at the time when I tried to call it. It ends up that he had been released several hours earlier, but had left his phone in the truck. For anyone that hasn't had the pleasure of being arrested, they impound your vehicle. So if you're unlucky enough to get processed and released after 5 p.m. or before 8 a.m., you're out of luck re-getting your vehicle back. Not to mention another couple hundred dollars in the hole. As I mentally ran through the list of options, I remember the hack I'd met earlier that week and decided to give him a try. I figured that at least, if he was awake, I could pay him to help me cop and drop me off at the Greyhound bus station to wait out the night. Well... I called, and not only was he up and about, but he was also about a 10 minute drive away from where I was being released. The fact he was still up and about at one in the morning may have given normal people pause. I just assumed he was probably a crackhead, tweaker, or some such, and wrote it off his luck. Within a half hour he showed up, and I clambered onto the long gray sedan just grateful to be out of the cold and back on solid ground. Now, to give you an idea of the way this guy came off, the best way I can think to describe him is gray. Everything about him was just gray. His vehicle was a medium dinged up gray. His hair was longish and a deep solid gray. Even his parlor seemed gray. I remember he had the face of a postmenopausal woman. Sort of jokingly, if you know what I mean. Soft. In retrospect, the guy was creepy as all get out. But at the time, he just seemed unexceptional. And really in the drug world, there are so many weird people that you're forced to deal with on a daily basis that unless you're someone that comes off blatantly hostile, you eventually learn to just ignore the crazy. If you don't, you'll drown in it. We managed to cop in Baltimore. There's only someone out. I asked the guy to take me to the Greyhound station, just wanting to get well and curl up till I could think of catching a bus. He just sort of looked at me, looked down, looked back up, then asked if I wanted to just come watch TV at his place. 
till the buses began running. Looking back, I remember feeling a bit hesitant, but the man seemed so unexceptional, such a non-entity that I couldn't imagine him being a threat. And if I'm entirely honest, I just wanted a clean, warm place to get it on. I was well beyond dope sick at this point, and all my consuming thought was just to get straight. Taking my silence for hesitation, I remember him telling me not to worry, that he wasn't going to try anything. I probably should have mentioned that I'm a 5 foot 6, 100 pound female, 20 years old at the time, and that the bus station wasn't really the safest place for a tiny female like myself to be hanging out at 2 o'clock in the morning, that he was just trying to help. Well, F me, but I thanked him and said sure, and we proceeded to drive out towards the county. To this day, I'm still not sure what direction we'd gone in. Just that wherever it was that he lived, it was about half an hour outside the city, and that it was not in the woods, but in a heavily wooded area. As we neared his house, he started acting a bit strange. Not enough to set off the alarm bells, yet, but still. I'll never forget him saying that either the police chief of that county or the chief's son lived in the same cul-de-sac as he did, that they were friends, and that the guy had helped him out of whatever he termed as a few predicaments. The house was right on the lake, with a dock in the backyard. I have no idea what county this was, and no one I've tried describing it to has ever been able to pinpoint it either. It was totally alien to me. We pulled into his driveway, and I was shocked to see that his house was closer to being McMansion than the hovel I'd assumed I was in for. He would go on to tell me, as he parked up and walked up to the door, that it all belonged to his mother, who had recently passed away. Here's this ratty little man with a ratty little car in an extremely, well, not nice, but expensive house, driving around all day and night for pocket change, and basically living out of Dunkin' Donuts. I was more than a bit skeptical. When we went inside, the situation became even stranger, but at least more familiar, more in line with what I'd seen of that guy so far. The house was covered in two things, dust and knickknacks. And when I say covered, I mean covered. Every square inch of surface space was covered with tacky little porcelain angels and dollar store crap. Shelves, tables, the top of the ginormous old box television. Even the kitchen was covered in them. The kitchen itself I only saw for a brief moment, but I'll never forget how even the sink was filled with things. There were the obligatory doilies that old people seemed to have in spades, all of them covered in dust and discolored. I asked where the bathroom was and excused myself to go get high. I was getting pretty weirded out by this point. I just wanted to get straight so I could decide what to do. I did my thing and went back to the living room, which was the first room you walked into when you came in the door. I didn't want to go any deeper into the house. I wanted to take a look at the lock on the door, create an exit strategy, and hope I didn't really need one. That hope was quickly dashed. The first thing the guy did was bring me a glass of water and a handful of pills. Puzzled, I asked him what the pills were for. He said, to sleep. Now it's 3 a.m. at this point. I have to be at the bus station by 6. At most, yet yeah, maybe two hours before we will have to leave. I tell him I don't think that's a great idea, since falling asleep isn't on the agenda, that we don't even have time for a quick nap. Well, he starts to become pretty insistent that I take the pills. Believe me, if I weren't so out in the middle of nowhere, not to mention it being December, and the bitter, bitter cold at this point I'd have booked. Instead, he sort of laughed and took two of the pills out of his hand, stuck them in my mouth and took a sip of water saying, well, what the hell? Immediately, he brightened and shuffled off to get me another glass of water, which I'd requested. Looking back, I shouldn't have even drank the bloody water. Idiot. I spit out the pills and shoved them in the seat of the sofa. The whole time we'd been talking about little things, Baltimore, local politics, music, nothing deep. At this point, he starts asking me about chemicals, about drugs. Specifically, what sort of drugs will knock someone out, but not harm them? How much would you need of what for someone to say, tiny like myself? I try to act as if it's entirely normal conversation, Potter. At this point, it seemed to me that my existence depended on me not registering how abnormal the entire situation was. I think my thought process at the time, and especially as time went on, you'll see what I mean shortly, was that I couldn't react as if I knew what was going on that I couldn't act as if there was anything strange or alarming occurring, that he would be stupid to let me leave and let me live if he knew that I knew exactly what was going on here, that I need to seem like a non-threat. The whole time we are having this discussion, by the way, the guy kept trying to get behind me. At one point he succeeded, started rubbing my shoulders. 
I just laughed and said I wasn't a fan of massages, that I needed to run to the bathroom. When I came back, I made sure to sit on the sofa that was up against the wall. I'm looking around for a phone, but I don't want to ask for one because I don't want him to know that my cell phone is dead. Yeah, another great stroke of luck. My cell phone had died five minutes after I called the creep to come pick me up. Now, this whole time the guy has been pacing around the living room, sitting for a few minutes only to get back up again, walk back and forth for a bit, and sit back down. He began talking about his mother, how she collected all these knickknacks, how she died, heart attack, and how he'd been thinking about renovating the house, but hadn't had the heart to make any changes to anything yet. So he says he wants to show me something. He wants to show me the upstairs. Why I didn't run screaming out of that place, I didn't know. I think part of me was still very much hoping that I was misreading the situation, that the guy was just lonely and creepy and socially maladapted, not actually dangerous or anything. But here we have yet one more horror film trope coming into play. Creepy obsession with mother, a bizarre dust-filled house, perfectly preserved in memory of mom, down to the last glass she used sitting on the kitchen table. I sh you not. Now the guy wants to show me the upstairs. He wants to show me her room. So I follow him up the stairs. At first he makes it obvious he wants me to go up before him, but I wasn't having any of that. We get to the second story. There were three. Never made it to the third, however, and turns off down this hallway. He opens the first door on the left, goes in, and I'm half expecting to see the body of his dead mom lying on the bed or something and find myself seriously relieved when I find myself standing in just one more dust-coated room full of crap. I don't remember much about the room. I remember the bed was made. And I couldn't tell if the comforter was dark, which is covered in so much dust that it appeared that way. He gestured for me to sit down. I blagged. What followed was the worst of the experience. He sat down on the end of the bed next to me and began talking about his mother. After a bit, he looked at me and said, You're so beautiful. You look like a little girl. I bet little girls really like you. Tried to lead the conversation back to his mom. He gets up and walks down over to the far wall of the bedroom. Starts referring to our earlier conversation about drugs and knocking someone out. He asked me what I would use to knock out a child. What I would use to keep a child knocked out for long periods of time. Safely. I'm trying at this point to act as if I'm still on point. As if I'm not finding this line of conversation to be dreadful, creepy, and horrible. I tell him I really don't know just a dope fiend, not a chemist. He asked about and if it would be safe. At this point, I've just done it, and I think he can tell. He says, I want to show you something. I begin to protest and tell him that I have to use the restroom, but he insists. He pushes on the cheap wood paneling on the wall, and a large square of it swings open. He gestures inside, says he's been working on it for a few years, and that it's just big enough for a small woman but made for a child. It's a sort of cot, and there are loops on the ends, for rope, or some restraint, I'm sure. I noped out of the bedroom down the stairs. I didn't run. I just told him I had to go to the restroom again. While I was walking, shaking down the stairs, I pulled my cell phone out of my purse and mimicked dialing on it. I was lucky that he stayed behind to close up the bedroom, and that thing in the wall, so he didn't see that my phone wasn't even turning on. I pretended to be having a conversation with a friend of mine, and at the point that he showed up, began loudly recounting what had transpired that evening to my friend. I told him how I'd called the nice gent we had met at the Dunkin' Donuts to come pick me up, and that I was at the guy's house, but I'd be leaving shortly. I then pretended that my friend had offered to come pick me up from the bus stop, and in one respect, I was lucky. The guy knew I was leaving out of town, but he didn't know I was leaving four hours away, or that I had any friend of mine that would have to make the hellishly long trip if they were to come pick me up. I told my friend that I was heading out to the bus station ASAP and that I'd see him soon. I still remember the look on the guy's face as I said that. It darkened. You know that look that snotty, spoiled little kids get when someone actually dares to tell them no? It was like that. It was that look. But worse. Because there was something almost perverse about seeing it so openly displayed on the face of a 50-something-year-old man. So I started to grab my purse, zip up my coat, all the while gibbering about how my friend remembered him and had said to tell him hi. It seemed at the time that there were two things that were of the utmost importance at that moment. The first, to make him feel that I hadn't found him or anything he had said or displayed odd, or they didn't want him to think I would be some sort of threat to his plans or well-being if he let me leave. Secondly, 
wanted him to know that he was identifiable and that someone, at least someone who could identify him, knew I was with him. That's pretty much the end of the story. Although I had one more, far worse encounter with the same guy a couple weeks after this incident. He took me to the bus station and acted the entire time we were driving there. The second encounter convinced me that not only was I lucky to be alive, but that I had spent several hours in the home of a serial killer. Do I think he had done anything yet at the time I spent the terrifying early morning at his home? No. I think he was gearing up to, though. By the second brief encounter I had with the guy, I'm positive he was. I don't know how to put it. That uncertainty he displayed with me was so gone. I think at that point, he'd crossed the line. If I haven't bored everyone to death and anyone wants to hear about the second encounter, I'll post it. In closing, I will say this. I did take down his license number as he was leaving that morning, and I did contact a friend of mine who was a police officer. A year or so after all this happened, my friend called me and asked if I still had the guy's information. He lost it, if he'd ever even really bothered to write it down at all, and there had been several disappearances of young children in the very same areas that the guy, in our second blissfully brief encounter, mentioned that he had trolled, just scoping out the little girls. I did try to find the man. I began by going to the Duncan that he had hung out at, the owner, who said the guy had spent every single morning there for a couple years, told me that he had just quit coming the same week that this happened, and I think I finally figured out why he hung out there every morning. The day I went there looking for the guy, I noticed that there was a bus stop in front of the Duncan, a bus stop full of elementary school kids. After my initial encounter with the Dundalk creep, I contacted a friend of mine who was a Baltimore City police officer, and gave him a description of the creep's house, car, his license number, first name, cell number, and a detailed account of what transpired that morning in his home. A year or so later, I would receive a call from the very same officer, asking if I still had a record of the info I'd given him. Unfortunately, I no longer did. And the owner of the Dunkin' Donuts on Eastern Avenue had no information on the creep. The last he'd seen of him, the creep had come by to show him a car he'd purchased. It was black, and a sedan. But that was all the owner knew. I was on high alert for a week or so, I'd receive a couple of sketchy calls from a block number, but nothing I could pin on the creep. Life went back to normal, my normal at least. And then after a couple of weeks, I was able to convince myself that I had exaggerated the entire encounter. After all, I was still breathing. So one day, Tom and I decided to take a trip to the city, pick up my stash for the next few days. Usually, when we went up to Baltimore, we'd pick up about five, six hundred dollars worth of scramble, 70 pills, ILW. This would last the two of us about two days, sometimes three. I had a hell of a habit. Well, this particular day, we decided to pick up a bit more than usual. Why? I can't remember. But the entire trip was cursed from the get. We were late leaving the shore. There was an accident in the harbor tunnel that ended up backing up traffic for a good three hours. And by the time we made it to East Beemore, my contact had dipped. I ended up getting in touch with another guy who sold out of Dundalk. So we went down to Erdman Avenue, the same Erdman Avenue the Creeps Dunkin' Donuts is on, and I had Tom park in a Goodwill parking lot so that I could go find my guy. Most of my contacts knew Tom, but this guy I was going to meet was one of those paranoid hitters, and it wouldn't serve me if he saw Tom's truck in the vicinity of where we were meeting, so I had to hoof it. I can't remember exactly where it was that he wanted me to meet him, but I'm fairly certain it was on Dundalk Avenue or Merritt Boulevard. One of those large roads that run through Dundalk like a vein. Whenever I'm in the city and I have to walk anywhere, I employ the look down, look at your feet, never look a stranger in the eye. If a car honks their horn at you, do not respond method of minding my own business. A large part of the reason I do this, the unspoken reason, is because a lot of the people assume that you're a hooker if they see you walking. Generally, if you don't respond when they honk their horns and holler at you, after a bit they'll leave you alone. And don't forget the police and the undercovers. It's their job to harass you a bit, and to see if you respond. To see if you're doing business or merely an unlucky member of a vehicle tier of society. On this particular day, I remember being more than a little spooked at the absence of traffic. It wasn't a nice day. It was overcast, gray, a standard January afternoon in Baltimore. But it wasn't abnormally sh either. There was certainly no reason for it to be so quiet. I was walking down one of Dundalk's larger roads. The traffic should have been steady. Should have been a few people shopping and walking about, at least. But no, it was just me and the occasional ragtag car. I was a mile down the road from my meeting point with my dealer when a black sedan pulled up next to me. It was the creep. 
He opened the passenger side door from the inside and told me to get in. Now, I seriously considered altering the story at this point to make myself look and feel like less of a... But so far, I've been entirely honest in my retelling of the encounters with this guy, so I'm not going to start lying now. Anyway, please cut me some slack. Over the three or four weeks that had passed since the incident at the creep's house, I had spent a fair amount of time talking myself into believing that I had over-dramatized the whole encounter, that maybe the little room in the wall in the cot hadn't been what I thought it was. In short, I had tried to convince myself that I was just a heroin addled junkie who had blurred the line between reality and fantasy. So when the creep pulled up and told me to get in his car, there were a lot of reasons why I did just that. Instead of doing what a sane person would, and start screaming, running, and pitching a fit and just generally noping the hell out of there, I tried to figure out why I did what I did that day. All I can say is, between having convinced myself that there was no way I'd actually experienced what I thought I had, and my dislike at the feeling that I had been a giant coward, I felt sort of compelled to face the guy and verify that, no, there was nothing strange going on, and that it really had all been in my head. At the same time, there was another dynamic at play. The fact that I was still sickeningly afraid of that creep. I remember pulling back from the open door of the car, looking around, looking at the whole lot of no one and nothing on that street, and thinking that if I didn't go willingly, he could easily run me down on his own. I told him I was busy, that I was on my way to meet my guy, and he said that was fine. He'd take me the rest of the way and drop me off, that he'd even take me back to wherever I was going afterwards if I wanted him to. So I got in the car. I was terrified, and I fell back into the same routine I'd utilized the first time around, acting disoriented, high, harmless, and glad to see him. I asked him what he'd been up to. He said, in perfect monotone, that he had tried to call me, why I hadn't answered, I explained that I used throwaway cell phones, that I had acquired a new one once my minutes had run out on the other phone. Remember I said that I had only been about a mile or less from the meeting point with my dealer when the creep pulled up? My hopes were pinned on him keeping his word and actually taking me where I needed to go. If that happened, I thought that everything was okay. I didn't need to worry, but of course it didn't. When he blew through the light we needed to turn at, I told him he'd missed my stop. Oh, he replied, don't worry. I'll take you where you need to go. I just wanted to talk to you for a minute first. I just felt sick to my stomach, and I could see that he was turning into one of those little parks they have dotted throughout the city. Parks with jogging pads and a few token toys and swings for children. If I recall correctly, there was some sort of school or government building in the background. I remember thinking that as soon as he slowed down just a bit, I was going to jump out of that car. I also remember thinking that I needed to relax. That if he even thought for a moment that I was beginning to freak out, my chances of him slowing down or giving me any sort of out would be nil. You see, the whole time I was sitting there looking at the door lock, the area we were in, etc. He was going on about how he had been looking up sedatives, and he wanted to get some Xanax and some benzodiazepines. How he'd really like my help, and how he'd been scouting out the park where we were at the moment, as well as other parks throughout the city and county. And how he was certain that someone like me by his side would help lure little girls back to his house. He could fulfill his dream. He said, and here's what terrified me the most, that he could use the dock behind his house to get rid of the bodies. I never disliked myself more than I did that day. The whole time he had been talking about all this, I'd been doing two things. One, I had begun to slouch down in the passenger seat with my eyes almost shut, trying to act as if I had nodded out. I could only see him a little out of the slit corner of my eye. The whole time he was talking about all this, he had been rooting around under the front of his seat. Slowly, sneakily, as if he was trying not to make any noise, you know? So when I would respond to him now, I'd make a warning gesture, like move your hand, to indicate that I was about to open my eyes. The last thing I wanted to do was make him feel like he had been caught, and that he had to pull whatever it was out immediately. The second thing I had been doing was how I was responding to his questions. Instead of acting freaked out or upset, I was trying to act like I was on board with all this but not too on board. I was trying to act like I was considering it, like I had the option to do this if I wanted to or not. I didn't want him to think of me as some victim, and I didn't want him to think that I was thinking of myself as a victim. I was hoping that if I had acted like his peer, like a potential partner in crime, that he would treat me like one, or at least pretend to long enough for me to get out of the car safely. He was still circling the little park when he began to slow down significantly, through this slim opening of my eye, through my eyelashes, I could see him reach as far down as he could under the front seat. 
all while watching me intently to see if I'd move. I knew it was the time to get the hell out of Dodge, because whatever he had, whatever it was he was looking for down there, he did not want me to know about it. That terrified me. And God was I lucky. I was lucky because at the same time he was slowing down, another car had come out of nowhere and was slowing down next to his vehicle. He sat up. I bolted. Just grabbed the door handle, fell out of the door and ran without ever looking back once. I pulled my cell phone out of my purse and called my friend. I had him pick me up from one of the stores on the corner of the avenue. I was bawling, terrified at my own stupidity, at how close I knew I had come to ending up in some psycho's dungeon. This is how he referred to his hole in the wall during his rant that day. All because I didn't want to listen to my instincts. Or hell, just pure common sense. I cried, and cried, and cried thinking about that creep, and the things he said he wanted to do to little girls. This is, for all intents and purposes, the end of my encounter with the Dundalk creep. About two or three months after all this had happened, I received a phone call one day. One I didn't answer because the number was unfamiliar. Later the same week, I checked my voicemail and it was the creep. He had changed his number and wanted to let me know. And also he had finished renovating the house. And he wanted me to come see it. He said he put an ad in some paper and was letting out various rooms as boarding houses to women only. And he had some interesting ideas he wanted to talk over with me. I forwarded his new number to my police officer friend and changed my own. Despite what I said earlier, when I had told the creep that my number had changed because I used throwaway phones, my number had never changed. I just never answered numbers I didn't know. And prior to our second meeting, I had not bothered to set up my voicemail at that point in time. To anyone out there interested in pursuing this, over the years I've tried off and on to find the creep's house. Now, at least with Google Maps, I may be able to narrow down the county. The Dunkin' Donuts he hung out at every morning for years is the one on Erdman Avenue. Google Maps shows the DD with the bus stop out front for anyone that's interested in checking it out. And I still think the best bet is the owner of that Dunkin'. Creep hung out there for years picking up business, drinking coffee, and talking to the owner. I refuse to believe that they didn't know each other a bit better than the owner made out, or that the creep just never showed up there again. I can believe that he may have cooled it with that place for a bit after our encounter, but I think it's almost a given that he'd have gone back eventually. The only other possible point of identification I can think of is the cop the creep claimed lived in the same cul-de-sac that he did. He said it was either the police chief of that county or the chief's son. I remember him seeming to find that amusing. He laughed about his friendship with the cop. But they were on the river. The cul-de-sac had to be accessed via a bridge on the main road. Beyond this recollection, I'm tapped. Let me know which story was your favorite in the comments. And as always, thank you for listening. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on any more stories like this. See you next time.